All right, I want to say ETM Hotep. Welcome to our YouTube channel, the Seshu Mahdi Middle Nature YouTube channel. And this episode, uh, we refer to it as uh, Welcome to the Sabait Dome, where misinformation and false claims related to ancient Kemet are addressed. All right, we use the these series of videos to discuss some, um, you know, some information that, you know, we may see on social media that may be inaccurate or not quite correct and things that are worthwhile and that people could benefit from. You know, we do our best to address it. All right. So uh, this episode is uh, dealing with a um, claim or discussion that was taking place on Facebook by our good brother Asarim Ka, also known as Adrian Jones on uh, Facebook. And um, so this is going to be a brief video and um, this is it was unscheduled. So I'm going to talk as though this is, you know, strictly for the recording. But I will look at the chat for those who may have uh, been notified and tuned in. I really appreciate you taking the time out to hang out and uh, tune in. Uh, but I will glance at the at the chat once I'm finished um, with these explanations. And then, you know, we can I can go from there. All right. So as the title of the video, I'm going to address a couple of things. I'm actually addressing a misunderstanding that I've already addressed and I've already cleared, clarified, but it may have been to a very limited audience, a uh, limited uh, amount of people saw the video where I already addressed these things. So I'm addressing it here uh, once again as a um, benefit to those who will be watching. All right. And hopefully the brother himself, uh, Asarim Kyle, brother Adrian Jones, will be able to uh, view this particular video because I, I will assume that he missed the other video um, because he made a recent video. So what I'm addressing is a recent video that he did about a uh, post that I did on Facebook. So I'm going to go over and just give a quick backdrop uh, of it. All right. So just going to dive straight into it. All right, so here is a um, here is the actual post uh, from Facebook. As you can see, this was posted all the way back in November of last year, but it was bumped to the top of the group page where you know you could see it in more you know more recently. And so, um, in this particular post, uh, I'll just read it, and then we'll I'll just you know give you the backdrop, and then. Uh, Make sure that we clarify everything. So I'll just read it. It says, as a teacher of Sesh Metanetra, Egyptian hieroglyphic, and Rani Kemet, which is Egyptian language, for seven plus years, I do my best to equip students of the language and the social community in general with quality information that is in keeping with the integrity of the discipline. There are many people who have shown interest in the language at various levels and motives. As they say, a lie repeated enough times will become the truth. Well, the same as with errors within any discipline. Here's an example of an error made that if left unchecked will become the truth in the community. Please take note of the correction and pass it on. When we know better, we do better. Okay, so the intent of this post was to do just that. You know, um, when something is repeated so much, people accept it and then it becomes the norm or the truth. So we have to, you know, keep our eyes out for these things and address them you know if time permits and if we can so then i have a side note here uh, we confirm gender and number of a word by the agreement it forms with this syntagmatic relationship with neighboring words for example we have masha pen which means this army and min minet ten which means this herd where pen is means this is a masculine singular demonstrative and 10, which also means this, is a feminine singular demonstrative, which is in agreement with its antecedent, let it be known. And so in other words, pen and 10 are both demonstratives meaning the same thing. It's just that one is feminine, as in 10, and the other one is masculine, as in pen. And so they have to agree with the its antecedent, which is the word before it, masha, is masculine singular. Therefore, it takes a masculine singular demonstrative. Min minet is a feminine singular 
therefore takes a feminine singular demonstrative 10. So that's all what this side note is clarifying. All right. So but this is what the actual post is addressing. So I posted this picture along with the post. And in the picture, you see a set of one, two, three, four, five glyphs. The three, the three strokes are counted as one glyph. Um, so we have five uh, glyphs in this particular word. Now, this particular word, now mind you, this is also dated um, November, back in November. Uh, so this particular word, we transliterate this, these glyphs, we transliterate this word as Kemet, K M. T. We put a dot there to separate the uh, affixes. <clears throat> so we have Kemet. All right. This is how we transliterate this word. Now, what I have in double arrow brackets is a translation of what this word means. OK. And so what I have here is the nation of the riparian country. All right. Now, so this is what the picture is saying and this is the focus of this particular post whenever you see the above word transliterated as chem 2 which is kmtu excuse me kmtw it is done in error the above word is feminine singular collective and is properly transliterated as kmt km.t as you can see here all right if it were a feminine plural word, it would be transliterated as Kemut or Kemwet, depending on how you pronounce it, which is K-M-W-T, where the W-T ending denotes feminine plural and not T-W. And then I go on to say gender and number are grammatical features taught on the beginner's level of the language. More examples of masculine and feminine collective. So we have, again, Masha which is a masculine collective. It means troop or army. And then men minet is a feminine collective. And it means the herd, a herd of cattle. All right. So the point of this particular post is to correct anyone who looks at this word here in the glyphs and transliterate it incorrectly as KMTW, Kim, Kim at two. And that's um, an error that that um, quite a few people make because they're assuming that this word is one plural and then two, they are assuming that or they're incorrectly transliterating feminine plurals with the W on the N. And that's uh, just incorrect. And so this is what this whole post is correcting and to make sure people are on point uh, with it so that. The incorrect way will not grow legs and become the norm. All right. And so that's the point of this particular post. And so now how does our brother um, Asar Mkar, Mkar come into play is that when this particular post is um, bumped up and made um, active where everyone can see it. Uh, so he chimes in, you know, and he says, um, the question I believe is this, though. Are you saying the term Kemet, as proposed in your post, is not referring to black as a description? And then he goes on and says, because it would not mean nation in the sense that you have posted it without more qualifying marks. In this sense, it would be just as good as Israelites claiming their country name on the Murnipatah Steli. All right. And then he says, um, we do see the femininity rule in use. So he asks a question. He asked the, the first comment was a question. And so I address it. And, you know, um, ever since I've been on social media, I all, whenever I ask, answer people's questions, I always quote exactly what I am addressing. So there's no confusion. And it's always been much easier that way because in typing things, you know, a lot of things can get misconstrued that and taken the wrong way. So I like to quote people verbatim and address exactly what I'm addressing, show them exactly what I'm addressing. So I quote him. I quote his entire question and then I just give an answer, a very concise answer. Um, I say, no, it is not referring to description. So that is the answer to his question. 
when he's asking me, are you saying the term Kemet is proposing your post? It's not referring to black as a description. I just simply say, no, it's not referring to a description. All right. So now, mind you, this particular post is about the incorrect way that people transliterate that word in the as a feminine plural when it's not. So that's the topic and the point of the post. So these questions um, of what's being asked of me is all is off topic, but I answer it uh, anyway, because, you know, we, we don't tend to be um, very strict in posts, but we want to do our best to stay on topic. And just as a side note, for those of you who are familiar with uh, forums prior to Facebook, before Facebook became popular, when people communicate with each, with each other online, they and we had groups and things. We were we were we used to do it on forums, and forums were topic driven. And if you if you're used to that, then you understand that it is very important to stay on topic for the benefit of any readers, because you can get lost in nested topics and people changing topics, and it's really unfortunate and unfair to those who are reading and learning and following along. So. That's where, you know, this kind of uh, point that I come from in Facebook posts as well. I try to maintain structure and order so that it could benefit people who are reading. Because otherwise, if you're on a forum or if you're on Facebook and you're talking to a person and you don't have any regard for the readers of what you're saying, then you might as well inbox each other. You know, that's the purpose of DMs or, or uh, instant messages or inboxing. Because if, if you're just going to talk to the person without any regard to other people reading it, then you might as well inbox each other. All right. So, I would just, you know, just keep that in mind. All right. So when you're when you're on a public forum, it's, it's important to to um, be mindful of other readers. So this is why I'm a stickler with staying on topic and making sure comments are are um, structured. All right. Okay, so to kind of uh, fast forward, um, he, he made a comment about the femininity rule, and I addressed that as well because what, I'm address what I address here is that, you know, people will say things like femininity rule, like the femininity rule. And so what I'm pointing out here in this comment or reply is that there is no femininity rule. Uh, no one who deals with the grammar of the language characterizes anything called a femininity rule. And so what I mean by that is that when when and it's more recent that, that we're hearing this when people say femininity rule. And in my experience, what I've noticed is that people who don't understand the grammar of the language and don't study it, they're saying this femininity rule. And it's not that no one describes such a rule, a femininity rule as a femininity rule. It's when grammarians or when we explain gender of the language. So it's not a femininity rule. It's it's all about the gender of a language. And gender is a grammatical category of the language. All right. So we discuss gender. Another grammatical category is number where we have, you know, singular, dual or plural. And gender, we have masculine, feminine, and in some language, you have neuter. All right. And so that's how it's explained. So when people say a femi the, femi the femininity rule, it's coming, you know, it's, it can cause for confusion. So this is basically what I am addressing here. All right. And so I even explain and just give a, a tidbit of information. Rodney Kemet, which is the ancient Egyptian language, has two genders that are used within a syntactic system of concordance or agreement. A word being feminine or masculine simply functions as triggers for the system of agreement in any given syntactic environment. The word in the post is grammatically feminine and will trigger other words to be feminine that have a syntagmatic relationship with it. So in other words, I am pointing out to the brother that this word here is feminine. Even in the picture itself, it tells you, I, I, I tell you there that it is feminine. I say the above word is a feminine. That's the gender. And then singular is the number. 
some and collective. So I'm explaining this in the picture already. All right. And so. Uh, so, you know, I'm just basically addressing this uh, femininity, like when people describe it that way, there's no such description of the femininity rule. You know, it throws people off and it causes for confusion. All right. So. Also, to fast forward, you know, we kind of um, go back and forth on that feminine T. And, you know, if you this is, by the way, this is this is a post inside of our Facebook group, Sexual Mind, Matter Nature. So if you want to read all of the comments, uh, by all means, please do. But for the sake of time, I'm going to fast forward because I want to get to what I want to address in the brother's recent video. But I'm giving you the backdrop here right now. All right. And so. um. So I'm going to keep on, I'm going to uh, keep forwarding because I'm going to get to the point that he's raising about his recent video. So I'm going to skip past the femininity because we go back and forth on the femininity. And uh, let's see, when we get down here. So by the time we go back and forth on the femininity um, or, you know, the, the, uh, the femininity and everything, I simply ask him. I kind of go back to the beginning. I kind of ask him, do you agree or disagree with the post? Because I already said that the word is a feminine, it's singular, and it's a collective. And so I just simply rewind everything back and ask him, do you agree or disagree with the post? Because that's what people should start off with. Like, lead off with that. Like, okay, I agree with the post, but in addition to, and then add your commentary, or I disagree with the post or this point of the post and then give your informational commentary then all right so i just rewind back to make it simple and um so then he he addressed i guess he's answering he says concerning kemet meaning black in the original no i believe it's i believe it is descriptive so he doesn't agree um now notice i said do you agree or disagree with the post now nothing in the post is mentions the word black or 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 defines you know talks about black or anything of that nature so even still um it's just you know a lack of being on topic and and fundamental communication um he said concerning kemet meaning black in the original there is no original where i'm saying that it means black or whatever the case is all right but then he says i believe it's speaking about people now this is where the 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 confusion comes in on his part and i'm going to explain that because he reiterates this in his video he said i believe it's speaking about a people your second portion with the full sentence i still don't believe it removed black kemet from the description the terms used uh commit to you etc you would be correct on so <clears throat> This is where I remind him. I said, this is where answering the question I actually asked would help. I asked if you disagree or agree or disagree with my post by post. I'm talking about the original topic post that you made comments on now. And he says, which I answered, which is above and so on and so forth. And so then I kind of slow walk. Uh, and quote, I say, whenever you see the above word transliterated as Kim to. It is done in error. So I asked him plain out, plain. Do you agree or disagree? And he never answers the question. All right. And so this is where, you know, communication breaks down because when people don't answer questions or answer questions you never ask and go off topic, then communication breaks down. It becomes very uh, difficult. So then he goes on and starts to hijack the post and introduce his topic asking me is this a country a land or a people and he posts uh a portion of the myrna potastella and then you have the um reproduced glyphs here and someone's transliteration etc <clears throat> so anyway to, to fast forward i let him know that he's um diverting the topic and everything but to help him out what i did was i said okay since you have a different question and you posting this picture what I did was I created a separate topic post for him on his behalf. OK, and here's this post. So I tagged him in it and I say, you know, let me help you um, 
to, you know, start a new topic so that people can follow along. So I, I re I quoted what he asked. Adrian asks, is this a country, a land or a people? And I repost the picture that he posted. All right. And so this starts a whole new, whole new topic. All right. And so this is where this is a confirmation of the confusion that the brother has from my post. All right. And so let me just go down. So he uh, comes on and says, well, Joe, don't try to flip the topic. Follow your own rules, especially the ones you just put for the for the meme demonstration on the other topic you tagged me in. Answer the question. Is it a country, land or people? And then he reposts uh, my picture. And um, by the way, I saw Imhotep says no land determinative. And he's talking about this set of glyphs here. There's no land determinative. All right. So that's what Asar uh, says. And then, so the brother Adrian says, correct, Asar. Um, so how did Wujau get riparian country? So this is where the brother is confused. And so what I do is I straight in a concise way as possible, in a direct way as possible, answer his question and clarify his confusion. All right. Right under it. So I quote him. He says, correct, Harold, uh, uh, which is a Sarmotep. So how did Wujau Erima'at get the riparian country? And he's talking about from, from my picture here. So I answer him. I say, the words the and of, etc., are not within the glyph group. Yet we add those for clarification in English. So, so right from the start, I'm telling him, that when you translate from one language into a target language, you have a source language and then you have a target language and translations or to translate something means trans means to move. And when you're translating, you're moving meaning from a source language over into a target language. And when you do that, you have to make adjustments because Language A and language B will most likely not have identical gr grammar and structure. The, the, the structure and, and laws governing the language A and language B will differ. And so you have to adjust when moving from language A over into language B. Okay. So a lot of times, um, uh, other words have to be added for clarification when you're doing this. So this is the example I'm giving. The words the and of are not within the glyph group yet. We add those for clarification. All right. Now, to further explain, I said the word is referring to a people. Or an aggregation of men or women existing in the form of an organized dural society inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth speaking the same language using the same customs possessing historical continuity and distinguished from other like groups by their racial origin and characteristics and generally but not necessarily living under the same government and sovereignty this is called national personification it is explained in our publication that the brother any heret posted a link for you. Um, and by the way, we recently wrote a book that explains all of this. And so that's what I'm pointing out to the brother. If he gets if he gets the book, which is a collection of essays, um, all of this will be made clear, clear to him, you know, uh, but uh, evidently he has not um, purchased the book. He didn't get the book because he still made a video recently um, with the misunderstanding and the confusion. So th the picture you posted is related to this picture. So so when he keeps posting this picture, it's related to this picture here. And so this picture here is showing three variations of the same word. All three of these variations is the word Kemet. And it's referring to the location, the country of Kemet, the nation of Kemet, the the um, the kingdom, excuse me, the kingdom of Kemet that we know today as the Arab Republic of Egypt. OK. And so 
when you define what Kemet means, it's it means the riparian country or the riparian zone. And so further here on this picture, I define what a riparian, the word riparian means. All right. And so he reiterates your meme is here. Now, I don't know why he posted that because he already posted it before. And I and I just said the picture you posted is related to this just to show him, give him some more context. So, again, this is a lack of comprehension um, and understanding. So. Because he's not showing that he understands what I'm saying or what I said to him here. All right. Instead, he posts a picture, repost a picture. All right. And anyway, so uh, you can check out the entire dialogue. So I'm going to skip on over now. I just want to give that that kind of backdrop that leads up to um, him doing a video, re basically reiterating those points. And so now I'm going to go over to the video and to his video. And I um, wrote down a couple of timestamps and hopefully these are roughly in their correct spots. It's just a couple of timestamps and I'm not going to be too long. And I just want to clarify some things. All right. So this is his recent video on his YouTube channel. And so I'm going to find um, a couple of the timestamps. I think I'm at one right now. So I'm going to let it play. You should be able to hear it. And then I'm going to pause it and then explain or give some commentary. All right. So uh, so here we go. Our discussion today, um, which is. Where is it at? This. A meme popped up. Uh, uh, our brother, uh, our brother Wujao, good brother. Uh, great grammar course. I've endorsed it before. Uh, not the grammar course, but the language course he had um, in the, the introductory to Merunetra. It was on my website when we did the Kemet Empire. So, um, you know, I endorsed him after I said, let me see what you're teaching. Just like I took in Fudishi's course. Just like I picked up Raketi Yaman's book, um, you know, and contacted her through the internet. Uh, in Fudishi, we flew out here. Um, Ujawa I took his course because we had been discoursing um, for some time on the internet. And before I met him, I knew Meru Netra, um, so I needed to make sure his was sound. You know, he professes yeah. to know it for seven to eight years. At the time when I had met him, it was some terms I knew that they weren't quite privy to. They were in uh, a group with uh, the brother Christopher, uh, my man Satep and Ron, some other brothers called the Guardians of Ma'at at the time. And this, at that time, I was using terms like Sesh, Seshu Ma'ani, Meru Necha, Rani, Kemet. These are the terms that I was using at that time when I met him. And okay, let me, I got to pause there because the brother is implying that I, me, or, you know, the 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 Seshu Mani Metanetra as a group, we didn't we're not we weren't familiar with the word Rani Kemet or Seshu Mani Metanetra, and that's just incorrect. I mean, you know, ever since I I started dealing with the language years 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 ago, um, I I fully understood that the indigenous name of the Egyptian language was Rani Kemet. Um, even in Coptic, you have uh, Ro, Ron Kemi. Or things of that nature. So, uh, so I don't know where he's getting that from, but just just to kind of clarify for for the record of this particular video, um, our group name, the Seshu Maa Ni Meru Netra, we explain and break that down. Um, how we came up with the name and where it comes from. It's actually an, an attested uh, name or phrase in text, and it's on our website. The uh, um, seshmedunetra.com website which is the home of the seshu mighty metanetra and we have a, a page dedicated to the seshu mighty metanetra and then you know we give the whole history and the whole breakdown of that so i just want to you know put that on record that i'm not sure where the brother is getting what he just said from as if you know i'm uh when he met me that i wasn't familiar with um Rani, the word Rani kemet or or um or Seshu Mani or whatever the case is. Uh, that's just incorrect. All right, but let's just keep on. And, uh, the brother uh, put together a great course, put the, together a real great course, and they're doing a book uh, concerning Kemet right now at the moment. Not right now, brother, ready. But, um, and 
it's him and uh, another brother, Asar Emmett Tuck. So they're doing some decent work over there. Not bad. Um, but as you can see on the screen, this is one thing that they tagged me in that was not quite up to standard, in my opinion, and grammatically, period. So he had brought up um, Kemet, the nation of the riparian country. Um, but he didn't mean to, to necessarily harp on this particular point. Now, notice what he said. He said, I didn't mean to, to harper on this particular point. So our good brother, Asaram Kar, Ka acknowledges that that what he's about to talk about is not the topic of the post. That's what he just did. He just acknowledged that that was not the topic of the post by saying that I, you know, there's no intention on harpering on this particular point, which is what he's about to go into and why he created his video. All right. So just want to make sure that that's clear. Here's what he's harping on here. It says, whenever you see the above word transliterated as commit to, it is done in error. The above word is a feminine singular collective and is properly transliterated as Kemet. If it were a feminine plural word, it would be transliterated as Kemet, as Kemwet, where the wit ending denotes feminine plural and not to, T-U or T-W, if you will, which is the quell check generally at the end or commit T as these stripes would have you enunciate on occasion. He says, gender and number are grammatical features taught on a beginner's level of the language. More examples of masculine and feminine collectives. And he goes on to say Misha, which is the soldiers, the troops. And then he goes on to say Men Menet, the herd, feminine. Okay, so now, so he, so again, he acknowledges what the point of the post is. He read it. He read the entire picture. And he says that's that's what I'm focused on. So remember, if we go back to what I what I showed you all, um, I asked him, do you agree or disagree with it? And he never answered. And see, and this is this is why I kind of subtitled this video, um, you know, the 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 fundamentals about communication. You know, when we're online, we have to we have to have some kind of um, basic fundamental structure to commu communicating you know if if a, a person asks a question or if i'm on topic and i'm talking about apples don't bring up oranges if you're going to bring up oranges at least address the apples first you you know you understand so so there's a, some kind of continuity and with flow with the conversation but don't just ignore the 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 actual topic or even when the, when you're asked about the actual topic to go off into something else and so this is this creates problems and it's hard to follow, especially on a social media environment or online. You know, when people are just reading and you can't you know, you're not talking to be able to uh, hear what someone say the little nuances and things like that. So it's important. And so so here the brother acknowledges that that um, my topic was simply to correct this particular error. And so I asked him, do you agree or disagree? And, and the fact that he did not address this you know, um, it causes the problems, which is, which is why, the, you know, this back and, f you know, brief back and forth is even taking place. But let's continue to see what, where his confusion actually is. Which you'll find, you know, you'll find these things here. But the problem is this top one, because it says the nation of the riparian country. So that part is wrong. Now, this is so this is his whole point. So it's not about the point I'm making in this post or what he read. Uh, his problem with this entire post, the post or the picture is the top portion where you see in the double arrow brackets where it says the nation of the riparian country. This is what he believes is wrong. But now let's 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 try to figure out why he thinks that's wrong you see the people here denoted with the strokes and you have this adjective here and you have the the the, the t here which goes into the feminine t rule or the singular feminine or the uh feminine uh singular or feminine plural okay so right there he's all over the place because he says that you have the people and then he he shows the the um 
I6, this first glyph is, is Garnico I6. For those who um, are familiar with that. Uh, he says an adjective. Now, he doesn't know that that's an adjective there or not. And, and you know, he, he didn't bother to, to demonstrate how he knows whether that's an adjective or not either. But I'm saying, then he goes to say feminine, feminine singular or feminine plural, whatever the case is. And again, that's that, that's not the case. This this uh, um, bread loaf here is a T. We transliterate it as a T. And so, so he's adding things in there that's also confusing the issue. All right. But we're going to get to exactly what is confusing the brother. This one is plural because it's got the people here. Now, he said this one is plural because it has the people here. Now, notice. So in essence, he must he disagrees with this particular post then because I said within the words which he read, I said the above word is a feminine singular collective and is properly transliterated as Kemet. If if it were a feminine plural, it would be translated as Kemwet or Kemut, depending on how you pronounce that, where the WT would denote the feminine plural. So he just said that it's plural, which is against what I'm saying in the post. So in so many words, he disagrees with the actual point of the post. But we're going to find out if he actually really does disagree. Then it's Kemet and it's talking about. He says, then it's Kemet <laughs> instead of Kim, Kim wet if it was plural. So he just said it was plural, but then he, he says it's Kemet, not Kim wet. So that right there. So this is an example of what I mean. Um, see, I, you can tell that the, the brother doesn't understand what he's attempting to talk about all right and I, you know and i don't mean that in a negative in a bad way or demeaning uh way uh i you know i don't know how else to put it the brother simply just does not understand the grammar of the language and i can tell that because of the things he's throwing in there that has nothing to do with anything okay one and then two he he said just now that this is plural but then said kemet if the word Kemet is plural, it would look like this, Kemwet. And that's exactly what I'm saying. So the lesson in this particular picture is being missed by the brother who's attempting to talk about the picture. All right. So I'm just going to continue. People, it's not talking about the nation of the riparian country. Okay, let me rewind that a little bit because that's, this is, this is the, um, the, a key to his confusion. Or feminine plural this one is plural because it's got the people here then it's Kemet and it's talking about people it's not talking about the nation of the riparian country now notice so his so the 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 source and root of his confusion which is why he's not understanding the lesson that's being taught with this picture is because in his mind when 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 he sees Kemet and it being defined as the nation of the repairing country, he thinks that I'm not talking about people. And so that's his confusion because he, he just now said this word is talking about people and not the nation. So in his mind, a nation is not people. And that is the fundamental root cause of his problem. For some odd reason, he does not know that a nation is a people, a group of people. The word nation, we use the word nation to abstractly talk about a group of people. If I say the nation of uh, Australia, I'm talking about I'm personifying the people of Australia as an entity, an abstract entity. And see, this is the thing. We explain all of this in our recent publication that the brother, uh, Eni Heret or Sean, had uh, linked 
the brother uh, Asaram Ka to get to, to 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 understand to get the book. We explain all of this. This is called national personification, where you take a group of people and you um, create uh, make them out to be an entity in the abstract. That's what a nation is. So a nation is a group of people. So when you say the nation of the riparian country, you're talking about a group of people of the riparian country. The riparian country simply is Kemet, the location, the kingdom. So it's the people of Kemet. But he doesn't understand that because in his mind, like I said, for some odd reason, he doesn't equate a nation with people. All right. And so and you're going to you're going to see more of this. You're going to hear more of this. I'm going to let it play out a little bit more. And this mistake was done with another term um, with the toponyms. It's when you start to use English toponyms and you put them over another language's toponyms. Or when you start to use English grammatic rules and start to put them up over other nations grammatical rules other linguistic grammatical rules other languages grammatical rules um for instance if i'm speaking spanish and i'm discussing toponyms most of the toponyms in spanish are masculine that makes them different in english they can be masculine they can be feminine i think there's a couple that are bi they're stuck together if i'm not mistaken but when it comes to other countries a lot of their toponyms. I have to pause it there. Um, everything he's saying right, right, right there is completely just irrelevant to the issue at all. Uh, period. You know, um, like I said, when you're translating from one language to another, there's hardly ever, ever a one for one equivalency. You always have to make adjustments because language A or the source language and the target language uh, most likely will not uh, share the exact same uh, morphology or syntax, which is what grammar is. All right. And so you have to make adjustments. The whole thing that he just said about um, sp Spanish and the toponyms, which are place names, being all masculine and English, it could be feminine or masculine, whatever. We have to understand that English doesn't have grammatical gender, uh, uh, masculine or feminine, um, you know, uh, like uh, outside of its pronouns. But in general, English doesn't have that uh, going on. So that is just adding to the confusion as well. But like I said, none of that is relevant to the issue. The real issue is that the brother does not understand that nation is an abstract way of referring to a group of people. That's the, the root of the problem. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because I already told the brother this in the Facebook post. OK, and and let me just go back to it so you all can see. And this is what I mean by a lack of comprehension. And it's it's just important for us to. Um, talk to one another and not at one another so that we can understand, because the point of communication is to have a meeting of the minds. All right. To synchronize your thoughts. And so here is where I explain to the brother um, plainly that I say the word is referring to people. OK, so now, mind you, this post. This post uh, or my comment was five uh, according to here is five weeks ago. So that's over a month ago. That's over a month ago. But yet he just made a video reiterating the same confusion but i already addressed him here and said that that the word is referring to a people an aggregation of men and women existing in the form of an organized drill society etc etc so i already informed him um of this okay so that is the the problem of um that's going on it's a lack of comprehension okay and so he he so instead of comprehending what I told him, he just repost my meme, my, my own picture, which he already posted right here. 
So 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 the the real breakdown is just in some basic fundamental comprehension. And when that happens, it, it could just mess things up. And so I'm just pointing this out that these are very basic things that that are easy to correct. If people just slow down and just understand what they're being told and what they're being taught, or at least understand what the person is saying first, then address what they're saying. I, things will be a whole lot easier. All right. But let me just go back. because I just want to show show that, um, you know, I addressed this already and I even did a video, another separate video on it already but let's go back to his video so i'm gonna um go through a couple more times let me just see what he finishes out and says here or feminine so you can't just grab grammatical rules that you see and impose them over the top of a different language and expect everything to fit and okay no one's doing that and actually, that's what I'm saying. Uh, when you are bringing meaning over from a source language into a target language, you have to make adjustments. There is rarely, if ever, a one for one equivalency from from any source language to a, another language. All right. Very rare. So everyone who translates knows this. This is like a basic fundamental uh, lesson number one, 101 of translations. All right. Translation is a science and an art. OK, you have to have a command of the grammar of both languages that you're utilizing the source and the target in order to make those adjustments. All right. So this is known. All right. This is this is known by anyone who does actual translations. But let's continue here. This was an issue. So here we have commit the nation of the riparian country and it's not this is referring to the people of okay again you see he he reads this kemet as the nation of riparian country he says it's not it's referring to the people so again he is he is further confirming his lack of understanding that the word the very word nation refers to people so when you see the nation of something you're talking about the people of something. But the reason why we don't simply say the people of dot, dot, dot is because we're um, creating the people in the abstract. The nation creates an abstract entity. OK, and that's just something that people have to go are going to have to understand. We use it all the time, but it's just something people have to wrap their mind around a nation of people is talking about those people in the abstract all right so let me just um go and explain this a little further so let me um break this down and hopefully this is where the lesson will be and by the way everything that i'm explaining and what would have helped the brother out and can still help the brother out is contained in our recent publication and by our i'm talking about this shemsu heru research team which is myself the brother asar imhotep and the brother sanjedi ankara all right we um published us uh, um a few complimentary essays that went along with a presentation that took place in april at the ascac um annual um conference okay and so that's what this particular publication is it, is, it happens to be about the topic, about the meaning of the place name Kemet. All right. So make sure uh, it's available on Amazon. So those who don't have it yet, shame on you. Uh, but it's available on Amazon. You go to Amazon and pick yourself up a copy. And we actually did a Q&A for the book uh, recently, uh, I think last week. And we'll be doing another one. We'll give more people a chance to read it and maybe come up with some questions that they may have. And we're going to do another Q&A. Uh, about the content of the book all right so here is the actual uh original picture that the brother of sarah has an issue with now he doesn't have an issue with the point of of what's being said or its topic or its focus what he has a problem with is what you see in these double uh arrow brackets right here 
the nation of the riparian country. And the reason why is because he does not understand that nation is an abstract word, is a word used for an abstraction of people. Okay? That's what the word nation is. All right? So, to clarify further, now notice, if I write it this way, the nation of Kemet, and put the riparian country in parentheses, what I am doing is I'm putting the meaning of Kemet in parentheses now. So this is talking about the nation of Kemet, but I'm defining Kemet. So in this original picture here, where it says the nation of riparian country, I am simply defining Kemet. I am actually unpacking the word Kemet as well. And we do this all the time. OK, but if I were to leave the word Kemet in there and just put the repairing country in parentheses, this is how it would look. The nation of Kemet. All right. And I believe if the brother had read my comment to him or have or maybe have seen it this way, he may not have had the, the confusion or the problem because then he will understand that the nation you got. You have to be talking about an entity of people, the nation of Kemet. OK. The nation. Nation of what? Of where? Of Kemet. Okay. And you no, know, for example, if I say the nation of Islam, you know, everyone knows the NOI, the nation of Islam. Okay. Of Islam is a prepositional phrase. Of Islam. It 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 puts the uh puts something in a circumstance which is which answers the question where, when, or how. The nation of Islam. You're talking about people. The NOI is an organization of people. But when you say the nation of Islam, you're you're treating them as an abstract entity. And that's what the word nation does. OK, so we say the nation of Kemet. It's a group of people being personified in the abstract and they are of Kemet. They belong to Kemet. All right. That's simply all, all, all this is saying. So now, just to just to let you know that we do this all the time, here here's what's going on. So we have Kemet, and then if I define it as the nation of Kemet, now whether you define the word Kemet as the black land, or the black country, or the riparian zone, or the riparian country, no matter how you define the word Kemet itself. If you were to um, include your definition within this, it will come out to be the nation of and then you're and then you're unpacking the word Kemet. So you would say the nation if you believe the word Kemet means the black land, then this entire thing will say the nation of the black land. If you believe it means the black country, you would say the nation of the black country, et cetera, et cetera. The nation of the riparian zone, the nation of the riparian country. All you are simply doing is unpacking the word Kemet in your translation because Kemet is not an English word. OK, and so if I were to leave it as Kemet, what I'm doing is I'm I'm leaving the Egyptian word or the Rani Kemet word as is the nation of Kemet. But if I translate that also, then I'm saying the nation of the riparian zone because I'm defining what Kemet means. All right. Now, here are some examples um, that you all should be able to benefit from. And we and again, we do this all the time. All right. And to show you the comparison and contrast of when we do it and when we don't do it, etc. So let's take three names of kings. Right. We have Senwasaret the third. This is how his name looks inside of the glyphs uh, with this within a, a Shinu cartouche. And so we transliterate his name as Zini Wasaret. And what the, his name means, we can say it in two different ways. We could say the man belonging to Wasaret, which is a deity. And we could leave the deity's name as is because you have one, two, three. The first four glyphs is the name Wasaret. That's a deity's name. Okay. So Zini is the man belonging to and then Wasaret. We can leave it untranslated 
and just define it as that, the man belonging to Wasaret. Or we can unpack the meaning of Wasaret also, and which is the sentence underneath of it, the man belonging to the powerful one. The word Wasaret means the powerful one. All right. Wasar is power and Wasaret is the powerful one. So the man belonging to the powerful one. Either one of those are acceptable. So likewise, going to the second name, we have Amen Imhet or Amen Imhat. And so we transliterate this name as uh, Amen, I M N, M, and then Hat, H, uh, what's the diacritic three, uh, it's capital A in manual decodage, and then the T. So we have Amen Imhat. We could leave the name Amen untranslated. And leave it as is and simply say, Amen is up front. Or we can unpack the name, the word Amen, and define it or translate it as well fully and say the imperceivable one is up front. Most people may translate Amen as hidden and say the hidden one is up front. So either one is acceptable. And so this is an example of either leaving something untranslated or translating and unpacking it in full. Lastly, we have the king Unes. Uh, we transliterate his name as Wenu Is. All right. Um, and some people say Winis. Now, most people will not translate his name. They'll just leave his name as is Unes or Winis, either one of those. But if we were to unpack it and translate it in full, it simply means he who really exists. And any one of these are acceptable. So, again, that's all that's going on here. The nation of Kemet, where Kemet is being unpacked and defined. And that is what is this is saying. Kemet, the nation of the riparian country. So the issue is with the word nation. So let's let's go. Let's go define what a nation is. So here is the definition of nation. And I quoted this verbatim inside of my response to the brother that I read earlier. So what is a nation? A nation is a people. There you are. A nation is a people or an aggregation of men and women. Again, people existing in the form of an organized dual society. Inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth. Speaking the same language. Again, we're talking about people. People speak languages. People inhabit a distinct portion of earth. The people are organized into a dual society. A people become aggregated. All right. So um, speaking the same language, using the same customs, people are using the same customs, possessing this, the historical continuity and distinguished from other like groups by their racial origin and characteristics and generally but not necessarily living under the same government and sovereignty. This term nation is describing people. It's referring to people. But we use it as an abstract entity. It's called national personification. This is something, again, that we explained in the book. All right. So when we say the nation of Kemet, we're, we are talking about people in the abstract. OK. So what is a country now? Now, here's where the confusion, because because a lot of people will use the word nation and country synonymous, but not really know the these these uh, distinctions that are that are within these concepts. OK. And so what is a country? Um, a country is the portion of the Earth's surface occupied by an independent nation or people so a country in its most general sense is not the people it's the place that's occupied by the people okay so so here nation and country are distinctly different because a nation of people the nation exists within a geographical territory that we call a country all right so let's let's keep going forward or the inhabitants of such a territory so here we see where the confusion can come into play because a country can refer to the inhabitants of such a territory or it can refer to the territory itself 
But let's go further. It says, in its primary meaning, country signifies place. Okay, in its primary meaning, it signifies place. And in a larger sense, the territory or dominions occupied by a community. So it's not talking about the community itself in its primary meaning. It's not talking about the people itself in its primary meaning. It's talking about the place. So a country and a locality and a toponym are one and the same in its primary meaning. Because it can even talk about a waste or unpeopled section or regions of the earth. So a country can refer to a barren location where, where nobody is there. All right. So that's in its primary meaning. But let's continue. But in its metaphorical meaning or but its metaphorical meaning is no less def definite and well understood. And in common parlance, in historical and geographical writings, in diplomacy, legislation, treaties and international codes, the word is employed to denote the population. The nation, the state or the government having possession and dominion over territory. All right. So in common parlance, which is in common in common usage in these um, areas, whether it's historical, geographical writings in diplomacy, in legislation, which means in laws written in treaties and so on and so forth, country is used to denote a population or a nation, uh, the state or government having possession and dominion over a territory. All right. So when we when we understand all of this and we understand the meaning of nation. Now, when we come back and read this, we can perfectly understand why this is perfectly sound and it's not incorrect at all. This particular word here that you see in the glyphs is the word Kemet. And it's referring to the nation of the kingdom of Kemet. And the kingdom of Kemet, Kemet is a riparian zone. And we refer to it as the riparian country. So hence, we say the nation of the riparian country. It's just that simple. That's it. So country can refer to either or the territory itself. Or the people who possess or populate that particular territory. Nation is a personification of a group of people as an abstract entity. All right. So I hope that's understood. And lastly, I just want to show this here. This is the actual an actual example of where this set of glyphs is used in an actual um, Egyptian text. This is the hymn of Senwasaret the third. And this is a portion of a line. And so we read it as E in F, Sa'ank in F, Kemet, Chesar in F, Shinenu S. And what that's saying is he came, he caused the nation of Kemet to live. Nation of Kemet is talking about people in the abstract. He dispelled its afflictions. And the reason why it is underlined and Kemet is bold is because this has an anaphoric relationship. And so I'm pointing this arrow to the S here or the folded cloth in the glyphs. This is a third person feminine singular pronoun. And so I'll just read the S that you see here is a pronominal suffix on the word Shinenu. And if it is a third person feminine singular pronoun. It anaphorically refers back to its antecedent, which is the word Kemet. And agrees with it in gender and number, which is feminine singular. So this word is feminine and singular. Therefore, the, the uh, pronominal suffix pronoun has to agree in the feminine and singular. The gender number has to agree. And so because this word is feminine and singular, this suffix pronoun is used. If this was plural, the suffix pronoun would be sen, shenenu sen, 
which would be their afflictions in the plural, third person plural. But it's third person singular. And third person can refer to he or her or it. And so in this regards, because Kemet is an abstract entity, it's referred to as it. So it's its afflictions. All right. If it was talking about people in the sense of plural people and not in the abstract singular entity, as we say, if it was the way that that people incorrectly say, then it should say their afflictions talking about people their afflictions it would be sin again all right and so it goes on to say the word kemet is in this text is not feminine plural and would not be rendered kim what or the made up kim to all right so hopefully that's understood all right but let me go back to the brother's video well, actually, I don't I don't really have to. I had some other timestamps, um, but I don't think that it's necessary to um, cover the other timestamps. Uh, but actually, for the sake of um, for teaching moments, let me go ahead and actually do that. So I'm going to play some other timestamps. Because it's a couple of things that the brother is is making um, some mistakes on. So we're at 1525. Let me try to forward it to here, right about here. All right. So like I said, these time stamps are kind of rough. So hopefully I'm around in the ballpark, but I'm going to let it play. Those first. Yeah, let's do that. So this is an adjective. It's treated like a verb. It's followed by the subject. Noun or pronoun. In this case, you know what it is. It's Kemet right here, right? So we go here. We go D. N Ra, and here's the determinative for Ra. Notice how these have determinatives. D, an offering, right? It's right. Ra caused, right? He, he gave it to you, right? Uh, and here you have Naket. N Aket. Naket. And then you have a determinative at the end, don't you? And then we have here, said Jim F, right? So here, what do you have? Kemet with a determinative here. So it says, Naket Kemet. It says, D in Ra, Naket Kemet. Here, Naket Kemet is treated as a said Jim F form and acts as an object for the verb D. This is D. Ra is doing something. What's he doing? He's causing Egypt to be what? With the stick. You see the brother with the stick? To be strong. And then Egypt follows it. Kemet follows it. Kemet. It's your K, M, your T, your determinative. Okay? So Ra, D, Ra, or he gave the strength. To be strong to Kemet, if you will, right? If we're more literal about our translation. So that's there. Let's go. Okay, so I got to pause it there. And so what the brother has done, he pulled up a website, you know, that um, I, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. It just has a couple of um, introductory grammar uh, points. It tries to explain a couple of things about grammar. I wouldn't recommend uh, this particular uh, page because it's it's brief i mean if you just want to glance at some uh, some things it's, it's it's okay but um you know i would prefer for people to actually learn uh the grammar but when he jumped to this particular thing then so every everything that he shows um after what i've already show showed is completely irrelevant and so this again, this is this is information that's put in there that adds to the confusion, because what he's showing on the screen right now is where this website is just simply giving examples of what's called adjective verbs. And so the brother Saram Khan never pointed out what is the actual adjective verb. 
in this particular example, which is the point that this page that he's sharing is making. That the word, the, the word is nachet or nachet. That word is an adjective. It means strong. So it's used to describe something attributively. So if I want to say strong book, for example, I would say majat nachet or strong man. Si uh, nachet, which would be a uh, strong man. So it's used attributively as an adjective. But what this website is doing is showing how these adjectives um, can function as verbs, referred to as adjective verbs. And so here in this example, the word nachet is a verb. And so it's in the form, as this website is saying, of sejim f. And so uh, Sejim F, by the way, itself means he um, he heard or he listens. All right. And so this is why I don't suggest, you know, perusing these kind of websites to try to understand grammar, because it's uh, it will definitely confuse you. But Nachet Kemet, as he's saying, is um, it's just showing that this is the country. This is the, the place. This is the actual toponym of the place. This has nothing to do with the subject matter that, you know, that or, or point that he was trying to uh, raise. This is just showing some, you know, some random things, you know, about grammar or whatever that you possibly found by doing a search on Kemet, uh, the word Kemet or whatever the case is. Uh, all right. So, you know, like I said, this is not this is not relevant at all. All right. Dian Ra Naket Kemet. Uh, Ra allows Kemet to be strong, or Ra caused Kemet to be strong. The word D means to give or to allow, all right? To, to permit, give permission to allow or to even give something, all right? Um, but they translate it as cause. Ra caused Egypt to be strong. All right, but let's, let's keep going. Again, when it's used. As a relative clause, it says this. He said again, when it's used as a relative clause, like what? What is it's? If he's talking about the word Kemet, if that's what he means by it's, then he's absolutely wrong. Even in this example, he's showing it being the word Kemet. Um, it's not used as a relative clause. It's used in a relative clause. And the word Kemet is actually used in this instance um, as a second part of a direct genitive construction. Again, this is why it's not recommended to, if you don't know the grammar, to go to these um, sites like this uh, because you'll be confused as we see. Now listen. This is the antecedent. It says, uh, Ramech, talking about the people, Kemet, with the determinative neti u m nf the egyptians who are there with him so we can see grammatically we have a match first then kim it must follow it with the determinative Grammatically, if you do not have that grammatically, we say Kemet and we know we're just talking about the people. Now, notice he said grammatically three times. And see, this is what I'm saying. A lot of words are used out of place and, and, and inappropriate. Um, not used grammatically, not used grammatically. There's no point in saying, in saying any of that. The word remage itself means people. And so what this fir these first two words are saying, remich, kemet, it's called a direct genitive construction where you have two substantives side by side showing a direct relationship, one possessing the other. And so when you say remich, kemet, you're saying the people of kemet. The word the is not in it and the word of is not in it. But when I bring it to English, I have to add those words so it can make sense. So we say the people of Kemet. Now, notice in the translation that you see, it says the Egyptians, because that's who they are. You know, when I say the people of America, 
I can say that or I can say the Americans or I say the people of China or I could simply say the Chinese. Either one, I'm talking about the same thing. So this is why this is where it becomes a little flexible for translators if they choose to say the people of Kemet or they say the Egyptians. Both of them would be acceptable um, and appropriate. So Remich Kemet is actually saying the people of Kemet. Or I can say it a different way. I can say Kemet's with an apostrophe S people. Kemet's people. Kemet's people who are there with him. Now, this particular page that he's sharing is going over relative clauses. Relative clauses contain relative adjectives. And the section he's on, it must be scrolled down some, but the section he's on has to be talking about relative adjectives because the actual relative adjective that makes this a relative clause is the word netiyu. Netiyu is the relative adjective in this clause. And so, so that's the point of, of this example. So it has nothing to do with my picture or the topic or, or, you know, that I showed or anything like that. This is, you know, but this is just being thrown in there, you know, for whatever the reasons are. It could be to, uh, you know, it, you know, inflate the gr grammar talk and to be able to say grammatical, grammatical, grammatical or whatever to make it seem like, you know, um, um, being knowledgeable about something. But it is really not neither here nor there. But even in in attempting to do that. Um, there's things that are made not made clear. So Remich Kemet Netiyu M Hena F. Netiyu M Hena F is who are. So that's what creates the, the relative clause. Something who are. And then there, Hena F. There uh, with him. So we have uh, there is M. And then with him is Hena F. With him. Or together with him. All right. So. I'll let it play. If we don't have the people there, we know we're just talking about Kemet, the land, the nation, the place. See where he said the land, the nation, the place. So, again, in his mind, he equates nation with a place and not people. And that is the root of his entire misunderstanding. And, and I keep bringing that up because I told the brother several times in our back and forth dialogue and and this is why i say it's very important and you know i think people really really need to slow down and do better at comprehension comprehending what they are told what they read and what they hear from people it's very fundamental it's critical it's critical because i wouldn't be doing this video if he didn't you know addressing his video it had he just simply understood what i told him Nation refers to people. It doesn't refer to a place. Like, do this. If you pull out a world map, pick a place. Pick, uh, let's say, um, uh, Australia. Big old island, island place. Australia. Or Madagascar. All right? If you want to stay close to Africa, look at Madagascar. When you look at Madagascar... You're not going to look at that and say, I mean, and let's say Madagascar was completely empty. No people live there. No, nothing. Nothing's there. You're not going to look at that place and know that nothing's there and say the nation of Madagascar. You're not going to do that. Because even in your mind, you understand that nation is a populace of people. Now, you may not know the technical term for it you know by it being an abstract personification or personification in the abstract as an abstract entity entity and and that it's being called technically it's called um national personification you may not know any of that but one thing you do know is that if madagascar was completely empty of people and bare you would not look at you would not call that the nation of madagascar because in your mind, you, you have this sense that, OK, a nation involves people. OK. So so that's the issue. The brother doesn't have that fundamental understanding and 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 equates nation with the place. Itself 
as if it's talking about the geography, uh, the territory itself. All right. And you just heard it. OK. So you cannot grammatically make that mistake. And you can see down here, Ramech Kemet is a plural antecedent and identical with the subject. You understand? So Kemet is here as a nation. Ramech is here as the people. See, he made a mistake again. He said Kemet here is the nation and Ramech are the people. Again, nation are people. Kemet here is the toponym. It's the place. It's the territory. It's the, the location, the land. Okay? It's something that you would see on a map. It's something that you would buy a ticket to go travel to. Okay? You travel to places, to locations. You relocate from one place to another. All right? And that's the, that's the difference. So it's, it's just some fundamental misunderstandings that should be straightened by, by should have been straightened out by now. But let's keep going. Hence, the relative adjective is a masculine plural and the subject is not expressed. So when you don't express the subject, it has to be grammatically written for you. All right. He's completely wrong there <laughs> because that's not even talking about that. Uh, Kemet, it's, it says, hence, the relative adjective is masculine plural. What the relative adjective that's masculine plural is, is the word net to you. That's the relative adjective. And it has to be masculine plural because it has to agree with his antecedent. And his antecedent is masculine and plural. It's not grammatically there. It can change the sentence. It can change our rules. In this case, you can see it right there. You can see it right there. And they put Ramech. They could have just they could have changed this to Kemet and had the people, which we'll show that in a minute too. And we'd have been okay. But they didn't. They put Ramech first and then they put Kemet and then they go on. Natiu M and F. The Ramech who are there with him. So you can see it as a relative clause in that sentence right there, right? Let's go, let's go further. He said you can see it as a relative clause in that sentence <laughs> when the entire example is a relative clause and the word Kemet is is in it. And so again, 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 this is how, you know, this is why I say that, you know, we understand. This is how I can tell that the brother does not understand the grammar of the language, because you can tell by the way that things are explained when somebody doesn't understand um, what it is that they're attempting to explain you, you can just understand all right so i just want people to understand that but let me go to another timestamp. i think it was coming up uh let's see oh i, I passed a couple of timestamps already uh, okay here's the next one 2255 which is about right here okay so let's play this one or the crocodile tell and you'll see the owl and you'll see the people now uh let's go to one more okay I may be skipping more. Some. so here we have 1932 let me go backwards then yeah i might as well let, have let that play all right here we go so you can see it as a relative clause in that sentence right there right let's go let's go further here, uh, where did I see it? Here we have it by itself. Here we have it by itself. It says, Mak. Generally, we say Maku, but this is Makui. But we say Mek. We'll, we'll go with the translation. Makui. M. Hot. H. Long A. T. Er, Kemet, determinative at the end. Er, in net. See the new symbol with the feet walking towards, coming to. In net. Aku, these two, this is the Aku 
the, the type of bird that it is. M N Herdui. Herdui. And you see the people at the end representing the children. N her Hordui. You can say whore if you want to in this uh, 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 application, but it's because you have the ooh sound right after. Or do we, right? And E is the determinative, but here the people at the end. So it's talking about, I am coming down to Egypt to bring food from there to my children. And as Okay, again, you know, this is not really adding to the, the original discussional topic so again you know the brother is is using this addressing my picture but talking about things that are not relevant to it and the points that are made but it's filler information to give the appearance that you know one knows what they're talking about by using you know certain terms and things um but even in that there's still a lack of understanding because even in this example here uh the word Kemet is a toponym. It's a place because it says I am coming down, which is traveling. The word hot, it means to penetrate or to travel down into something. I'm I'm coming down uh, Er Kemet, which is to Kemet or towards Kemet. And then in that to bring and then Aku, which is food. Uh, Emen Kered, uh, Keredu, E, my children. All right. So, um, there's, you know, it's not nothing really relevant there. The Kemet here is talking about a place, the location somebody's traveling to. Okay. That's, that's just, that's just that. I don't, I don't know why, you know, this is being shown or brought up. All right. So I'm going to fast forward, I'm going to forward to another one. bringing food to the children you see the children are here determinative as people and you see Kemet separate with its determinative okay above you have something similar because it's talk going to see 2255 the tell and you'll see the owl and you'll see the people now uh let's go to one more Let's go to one more. So here we have Hab, H A B, Kui, K W or U, I, Er, Kemet, Kemet. I was sent to Kemet. That's what you see. And you see, like I said, every time you're going to see Kemet behind, unless it's Kemet with the people, which let's go to the dictionary. Wait, before he goes to the dictionary, I, I just, again, you know, he's just showing an example of Kemet being used as a toponym. You know, people, it says, you know, I um, was sent to Kemet. I mean, that's a place. Like, I send you to the store. So, I, you know, it's not. I'm not quite sure why that's being brought up, but let's let's go. Let's see what he says about the dictionary, and I'm going to show you. This will be my last comment about this because this is something interesting that that's said here, and this again, and you can you can see where there's inconsistent logic or just a lack of understanding, and so you know I just want to point out that it's it's just important for us to one. Just practice and cultivate good comprehension skills. Uh, talk to one another, listen to each other before having these responses. And I and I blame the 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 atmosphere, the environment that we have created, where people are adversarial and competitive, and a lot of ego driven, um, uh, inflated egos that are that are rampant, where people can't talk to one another and really understand, like. It's almost as if two people are talking and while one person is talking, the other person is just waiting for them to be silent and then just say what they want to say. They're not really listening. 
They're just waiting for the noise to stop. And that's very primitive. That's that's like that's like going backwards. You know, we should be more advanced in our communication where when someone's talking, they're not just making noise. They're 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 transferring thoughts and meanings and and concepts. And you're supposed to listen, uh, digest them and then respond based on it. But that's not what we see a lot of times. But anyway, let's just see what he says about this. These examples here. This way you can just see them. When it goes to the dictionary and we look at the dictionary, then we can see the people called Kemet. And it's talking about the people directly as a collective now, right? So let's look at a few. Kim, black. Let's go further up. Huh? Here we go. Yeah. Kim, black. This is what Asar Emetep was talking about with the hairlock. D3, Gardner Code D3. So you have I6, which is here, either the crocodile tail or foot or the burnt bark. You have the owl, which is G17, and you have the D3. Here we have bitter lakes, they say, for locality. You see this determinative with the hills at the end? Yes, K M W R Kim Ware, Bitter Lakes. You'll also see this as Great Black. You'll also denote that those Bitter Lakes over next to the Nile area we used to be called the Black Sea. No one's gotten into that yet. We won't, but just so you know, and when you go into the Greek. They still call it similar, <laughs> but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic. We, I, I'm, you know, like I said, we're just pointing this point out. So you're clear on the subject, grammatically, how this needs to appear. Here we got conclusion of a book. Kimiyet, Kimiyet to it looks like, but it's Kimiyet. And that's the end of the book. You don't see any people, no correlation. In that fashion. Here you have Kemet, the black land, Egypt, a locality. Why? Because we know what Kim, this is Kim right here with the hairlock, right? That's Kim with the hairlock, right? Here's Kim by itself, right? Completion, final account of. You see. Now, so here's a major error, and this is the point of contention for the entire, entire discussion, the, the larger discussion that we're having about the meaning of the place name Kemet. What you just saw the brother Saram Ka do is what we're charging everyone doing uh, for doing inappropriately or um, mistakenly. OK, there is a general long-standing assumption that the Kim in the the place name Kemet is the adjective Kim meaning black no one has ever demonstrated how the Kim in the word Kemet it's talking about the kingdom is the same Kim as in the adjective black meaning black no one has ever done that. No one. It's just an assumption made from early Egyptologists that have continued to this very day. And so, again, this is what I addressed by saying that when something that is wrong uh, is repeated over and over again, it becomes the norm. This is an example where people are just normally assuming that the Kim and Kemet is the adjective black. And this is why scholars such as uh this dictionary entry will say the black land but no one to date has ever demonstrated that the kim in the word kemet means black and reason why this is an issue is because of the other examples that you see on his screen that he's sharing so notice that you have other words kim so he so when he went over kemet as far as the, the toponym in this dictionary it calls toponyms locality. 
So where it says locality, Kemet, and it says the black land, Egypt. When he just read that, he went back up to Kem, meaning black, up here with the hair lock determinative. Okay? But why? And so he is under the same assumption that everyone else is, that the Kem and the word Kemet is black. But the question is, why didn't he go to the other Kim? Because here, Kim means completion. So why don't we call this the completed land? The completion or the completed land. Because we have Kim, that means black right here with the um, rolled papyrus determinative. And we have the exact same uh, glyphs for a different word, Kim, that means completion. So why can't this particular Kim be the one that's used or that's meant for this uh, word Kemet? Why can't why have why don't they call this the completed land? The land that has come to fruition. The land of completion. Or the land that is at the end. Because the word Kim down here is another one. Uh, let me move this out the way. Identical again. It means to total up, to amount, to complete, to put to an end. And notice that this commit is to come to a conclusion. What is a conclusion? A conclusion is to come to an end. Here's Kemet right here. Completion, final account. So why couldn't we translate this, this name for the place as the land at the end why why not because the Nile flows from the mountains in the south up northern in a northern direction towards the Mediterranean Sea and it and it ends right there so Kemet why can't Kemet be the end country the country of the completion the country at the end why couldn't it be that you see what I'm saying so so again, the brother is doing exactly what other people have done for the longest time and have no demonstration, no uh, uh, um, information to support that assumption that it means black land. They're just assuming that this is the one that's used, that this Kim. But Kim can mean many things. All right. So anyway, I just want to point that out and I'm not going to play anymore. Um, because all this is really, you know, kind of is irrelevant to the, the my original post that he is addressing. So just quickly to review real quick, because um, I know that was long and everything. But uh, just to quickly review the the heart of, of the problem is in the brother and anyone like him in, in their lack of understanding one of, of the grammar of the language, period. OK, because there's, there's a lot. You can't microwave this. All right. Um, that's one, but two, it's just a very fundamental problem of understanding what a nation is, because again, let me show this again, this particular word, I'm defining it as the nation of Kemet, but I further divine, define Kemet as the repairing country. That's it. So this is it all together, fully unpacked where in this definition, there are no Egyptian words. The is not an Egyptian word. Nation is not of the repairing and country. All these were one, two, three, four, five, six words. These six words, none of these six words are Egyptian. So I have fully unpacked it. Now, if I were to leave it as the nation of Kemet, then I'm leaving the word Kemet alone. And I can do it this way to, to for those who may better understand it written out this way where I put the, the meaning of Kemet in parentheses instead the nation of Kemet what is Kemet a repairing country the repairing zone and we go over this in this in in our book so again if you read the book all of this will be made even more clearer so I just wanted to kind of summarize um, that that's really where the problem is because he says that this is wrong is wrong because he thinks that that nation is talking about the geographical territory and he, and he, and you you hear that confirmed in 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 the, the clips that I played and that's where the problem is so anyway
just wanted to kind of cover this up and hopefully the brother understands and i you know i'm making this video because i've already explained this to the brother and you know uh it's a limited audience so i'm doing this here for the archive of this channel so that you all can share watch it rewatch it and um or watch it for the first time as an archive video all right and so hopefully you have learned something um you have to be able to take away something from from what i've covered uh today all right so again uh, the original point of this particular picture that you see here is to let everyone know that this word is not plural. Even though you see three strokes, it is not plural. The three strokes is a determinative. OK, and it has optional meanings. OK, it it's a determinative to denote talking about a collective, which is grammatically singular. So we can't say so all those people who say these are three plural strokes when they say the three plural strokes, that's not correct. You know, I don't encourage people to call these three strokes the plural strokes, just call them three strokes. Because they are three and they are strokes. But they do not denote plural all the time. All right. It is a determinative and it could talk about a collective or it can also um refer to uh in the most times the 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 collective but also where words are derived from other um word classes all right we refer to those as derivational morphemes but that gets into a, a more detail that i'm not going to go into now all right so just keep that in mind so this particular word is feminine and singular we would translate it as kemet but what does it mean it means the nation is referring to the nation of the repairing country or the nation of Kemet. That's it. And I show where it's actually used. Here, it says he came. E and F is past tense. He came. E means to come. N will be, you know, a completed action or something in the past. Uh, F would be um, the masculine singular pronoun. He. So he came. And Sa'unk and F, he caused to live or enlivened. And then Kemet which is a personification of the people. And we refer to that as a nation. This exact same wording here is used similarly in the hymn to the inundation of the Nile, where the Nile itself is personified as a deity called happy. The flooding is personified as a deity. The inundation is the deity happy and when happy comes, when he comes, he causes Kemet to be enlivened. When the flood of the Nile comes, it brings everything back to life. And what does that do? It, it dispels all of its hardships. When the flood comes, everybody rejoices. And this is saying the same thing. This is a parallel, but it's being identified to King Sinwasoret III. He came, he caused the nation of Kemet to live, Sa'ank. And then Kesernef, which is he dispelled, he pushed away or he, you know, did away with. What? Shenenu, uh, afflictions, and it is its, its afflictions. What is it? The personification of the nation. All right. This exact same thing is said about the Nile itself. Happy in particular. The deity happy. All right. So anyway, um, I, you know, I appreciate those who may be tuned in. So I'm going to check the, the chat now, finally. So if those who are tuned in. Um, OK, I actually see people watching. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, so, you know, uh, I want to say ETM Hotel for those who are watching. And if you have any. Um, if you have any questions right now, you know, go ahead and type them. In. I know there's a, there's a slight delay, but I'll, I'll entertain um, some questions. If you have any questions about anything that I said, you know, I'll do that for a few minutes before I close out. All right. I don't want to make this longer than I've already uh, made it, but I will entertain some questions. And I'm going to actually scroll, see if anyone had already asked questions uh, before. So, yeah, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate those who are tuned in. Um, you know, my intent was to just do the video and have it up here as an archive. Um, preferably, okay, so Marcel Amenhotep says, so just so we're clear, 
Sean, don't beat me up. Kemet means black land, not black as in people, right? Okay, to, to answer the question, Brother uh, Marcel, the word Kemet does not mean black people or it means black land. All right? I mean, I can't make it any more straightforward and simple than that. The word Kemet, as when it refers to, when we're talking about the country or the kingdom of Kemet, because, you know, we, we, we talk about kings. Kings have kingdoms. So when we're referring to the kingdom of Kemet, the word Kemet means the riparian zone or the riparian country. That's what it means. It's not it's not talking about the people's skin color or any of that. All right. It's um, it's identifying with the wetness, the availability and the access to water. Listen, you have to understand that we got to kind of take ourselves out of our modern day uh, luxuries. We have to understand that in ancient times. The people did not have the luxuries that we have today. They did not have running water where you could turn a faucet on and the water just runs out. Um, they didn't have elaborate um, uh, piping and sewer, sewer system where you can flush a toilet and don't have to worry about ever seeing your waste again and so on and so forth. None of that stuff was, was um, the norm in ancient times. And you have to understand that water is essential to life and living and to a people who became agriculturalists, which who the Egyptians became or were water and sunlight are very, very critical and important to those people. It did not rain all like that in Kemet. So the water supply for the entire sustenance of the people was based on the flooding of the Nile. So everything was about accessibility to water. This is why they, they um, dug irrigation channels, canals, and did irrigation to, to allow the water to stretch further out from just the, the strict bed of the, of the river itself. They branched the river out by digging canals and had irrigation systems, entire irrigation networks that were created and built. So it was all about accessibility to water. So when they named the country in the 11th dynasty Kemet, it came after the um, first intermediate, intermediary period that was caused by a drought. So when you go through a period of a drought and your whole livelihood is threatened for years, then things go back to normal and water, the, the water levels come back to normal and the Nile starts to flood um, like it should and, and everything like that. You're going to emphasize that. And Kemet became the name Kemet or the country Tawi became called Kemet because of of the 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 uh, restoration of that accessibility to water. So it's all about the wetness. And the opposite of wetness is dryness. And so you have the wet lands, the wet areas, the areas that have access to water called Kemet. Then you have the the lands or the or the geographical territories that don't have access to water. Called Desheret. The word desher has the word shu in it um, etymologically, and it means dry or to be to be absent. Something is absent. Something is missing. Desheret is dry land. Kemet is wetland. Land that is accessible to water, Kemet. Land that is not accessible to water, Desheret. I can't make it any uh, plainer than that. The reason why people get this black from is because of this assumption, because there is a an adjective in the language Kim that does mean black. And it comes from a word that means hair. Because your hair is naturally black, just like there is a word for red in the language called the share. 
And that comes from the color of an actual bird. It looks red, just like black comes from an actual physical appearance of your hair. It looks black. The bird looks red, the share, the hair looks black. Kim. That's where pe but the assumption is that that Kim is used for the word Kemet, not knowing that there's another word Kemet that means total completion, all that kind of stuff. And is a Kim that identifies wetness. Wetness is the is the is the is the um, is the focus, just like the share, although there is a word that means red, the share in Desheret is not talking about red it's talking about the dryness. All right. And that is that has to be understood. And just by the way, anything that becomes wet becomes dark. If you have on a red shirt right now. If you have on a red shirt. And you pour water on it, your red shirt will become dark red. If you have on a blue shirt. And you pour water on it, it will become blue. I mean, excuse me, it become dark. A dark blue. So your red shirt, when wet, becomes dark red. Your blue shirt, when wet, becomes dark blue. As it dries, it what? Lightens up. When your dark red shirt being wet starts to dry, it becomes lighter red. When your dark blue shirt being wet dries, it becomes lighter blue again. The wetness creates this darkness. And so people are trying to associate that, all of that. So we have to be clear on all these things. You know, Kemet does not refer to the skin color people. Why would people who were farmers, who relied on the water, on the Nile, matter of fact, the king, his job was to assure that the Nile flooded properly to appease the deity so much so that the Nile flooded properly so that the food could be grown to sustain the people. What you're looking at on the screen, he came, he caused the nation of Kemet to live, is that very reason. The king is being likened unto happy. How happy is the personification of the flood. And when the flood comes, or I can say it differently, when happy comes, hence when the flood comes, it is happy or it is the flood that enlivens the nation of people and dispels their challenges, their gripes, their afflictions, their hardships and all that other kind of stuff that comes with a drought or comes when in the um, dry season. It's when the water comes that everybody is good to go. Why in that situation, why would people focus on their skin color? When they themselves never even painted themselves as a national color for the entire existence of Kemet. On their own walls and their own under their own agency, they didn't color paint themselves with the pigment of black. It's all reddish brown. I went over all this stuff before, so it should not be confusing. So anyway, just wanted to kind of just reiterate that of uh, uh, fire lighting tests. I may be late, but the whole black land thing is a misconception, maybe relation to black soil. No, because if you call the entire country Kemet. The entire country encompassed the dry red, uh, as they say, yellowish reddish soil and the green, the greenery, the black, all that stuff. So that that can't be it either. We have to understand we have to just go back in history, go back in time that Kemet was not always called Kemet. Kemet did not become called Kemet by the people until the 11th dynasty. So from dynasty one to ten. Kemet was not called Kemet. So are we saying that all of a sudden Kemet became black? All of a sudden the soil turned black in the 11th dynasty? So somebody, so somebody woke up out the bed and was like, oh, wait a minute. Wait. You know this soil is black? Hmm. Let's call the country black. Let's call the country black after the soil. I mean, they decided in the 11th dynasty to do that? You know, so and likewise, for those people who think Kemet is talking about the skin color of people, what does somebody wake up and just say, hey, you know what? My skin is black. Your skin is black. 
Let's call a country the land of black skinned people. After the 11th dynasty? <laughs> I mean, so listen, you don't even have to be knowledgeable about the language. I mean, you know, all the grammar intricacies and things like that. Just, you know, we could just deal with just straight surface logic. That's it. Logic. But anyway, so uh, I just want to, um, you know, reiterate those things. Looking for any questions that anybody has. Um, so, Marcel, uh, you said you just want clarity. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, you're, you're clear. You're clear on it. If you're not, you know, a ask your questions. Uh, Phi Light and Tist. Uh, that everyone makes assumptions and not knowing who to really trust, I bet, is what's confusing. You can trust with Jao and Seshu. Yeah. Well, you know, like with me, I, you know, my, my thing, I encourage people to learn to discern because I don't, I don't like for people to, um, like, I don't, tr I don't tell people to trust me because by telling people to trust me, then the next man could say the same thing, you know? So I try to empower people to be able to discern themselves. So I try to give people the tools to figure this stuff out themselves. And I just aid them, guide them, point things out and, and, and all that kind of stuff. That's what a teacher and an educator does. Uh, remember, a teacher and educator are two ends of the same coin. A teacher points out things and an educator draws things from within out of the person. Education comes from the word educare, which means to draw out and to teach is to point, to point out something, to bring attention to something. And so when you teach and educate at the same time, that is the best combination. And so I try to make sure people have the tools to do this themselves. And, you know, you guide people on, along the way. And so I'm saying uh, logic is a is a is a big tool that, you know, we need to definitely brush up on. People have to understand. Uh, but I'm looking for any questions that people have. Uh, Marcel says I was just confused on how he was explaining Kemet. But I sort of get it now. I don't see. I don't know. It, it, it the confusion is because w for some reason we have baked in our mind that one. You got to understand, Kemet is a place. When you today, Kemet is not called Kemet anymore. It's called the Arab Republic of Egypt. And when you go buy a plane ticket to go there, you're buying a plane ticket. To travel to a place. A place. A, a name for a place. Never refers to people. Ever. Toponyms. That's what they are. Toponyms never refer to people. They refer to places. That's why they call toponym. You know. It's a place name. So. If you want to know the meaning. Of the place name. Which is what the larger question is. Um, the assumption has been for years that that it means black, that the Kim in the word Kemet means black, but it doesn't. No one has ever demonstrated that. Ever. That's just the assumption, because there is a word Kim meaning black, but it's a word like I like I like I told you all, there's a word Kim that means completion. So why? So just ask yourself. Why didn't the first Egyptologist or the early Egyptologist, why didn't they translate Kemet to, to, to mean the completed land? Why didn't they do that? Ask yourself that question. Why didn't they do that? Because, you know, to call it the black land, is just a toss of the coin. Like they just put some different things in a hat, and just pick whichever one and it's stuck for this long, this, this long. So uh, let's see. This hypothesis is regurgitated hypothesis. OK, um, when are we going to start talking about the philosophy and spirituality of Kemet again? Um, I do. I do deal with that, but I do that in private sessions because there's a lot of um, misinformation and pseudo pseudo ism surrounding Kemet. The, the Internet is flooded with that, inundated with a lot of um, misinformation a lot of people are into things that are just based on misinformation, based on, um, you know, 
pseudo stuff, pseudoscience, you know, a lot of the different things. So, you know, in order to discuss those things, it has to be done in a very uh, um, structured way. And so I talk about those things, but I'm trying to equip people with an understanding of the language so that you can actually look at the text and see things yourself and you can actually correct or filter out the misinformation. All right. So that, you know, so that that's like along with it. But I do give I do give, um, you know, I do have uh, side discussions about the philosophy and, and the, what people are calling the spirituality um, of Kemet and things like that. But you have to understand a lot of things. But that's a, that's what people like to talk about. That's what they run into, run to get to talking about it. But I think it's prematurely done for a lot of people. That's why you got people talking about chakras, people talking about aliens, people talking about flying saucers in Kemet, people talking about the the unk being a symbol of the womb and the penis and the and the children and all this other kind of stuff. You get some crazy outlandish type of things because people want to skip so much and run and and jump straight into the pool of uh philosophy and, and spirituality. But there there's steps to lead that lead to that type of discussion. All right, we gotta we gotta take care of those things. All right, because what people call spirituality in and of itself is is misunderstood. Religion, spirituality, you know. So we gotta understand. Gotta understand. Um, let me see. I keep going through. Uh, da da da. The connection to how the Ifa name. Their regions and how Kemet had cults is oddly similar to me. Okay. Samuel for the private. Okay. Uh, like the lies express saying there was homosexual on the walls of Kemet, which is absolutely false. That's true. I'll give you an example of that. A lot of times Hebrew Israelites will try to use the tomb of the, the two brothers. And they'll show that picture and they'll say, see, this is gay. This is homosexuality or whatnot. But they don't. Let me see if I can find it real quick and share it. Uh, let me see if I can find that picture. If you all are familiar with the picture, they they uh, they they like to use a particular picture. And let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, see if I can share it on the screen. Let's go to images and all right, yeah. So switch my screen over. Maybe it may, may be too big. No, it should be good. So y'all y'all should be able to see this. I just I just pulled it up. Uh here. So if you can see it, let me see if I can. All right, so you should be able to see it now. Good. So yeah, they like to use they like to use these kinds of pictures and and um, imply that you know Kemet was was gay. Kemet is homosexuality. You know they they they're going to charge the entire country, the entire kingdom as being gay because of pictures like this and whatnot. And so what they don't understand, and this is why it's important to approach any culture by way of its language, is because what they don't understand is that the very word brother in the language when you write it out um there's a a way that you can spell it with a downward arrow or with the nose and so the nose has the 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 uh, represents the sound sin and for the word for brother is sin or sinew which is also the word for two and it implies that there's another so when we say brother, we even say it today, like we'll say, that's my brother from another mother. And so your brother or your sibling is a second you. And so sin as brother or sin, sinet as sister are the masculine and feminine form of it. But sinu would be the number of two. So it's a double. It's your double. It's your other you. 
that's how they saw siblings coming from the same womb. If you if you if you come out the same womb, you have the same mother, then that is two things. Two. And if it's a feminine, like I said, Sinet. Or sin we, two brothers. But the point though is that this is a, a visual representation of the word brother. That's it. And that's one. And then two, we have to understand that the scribes, when they carve things, they use what's called an aspective method as opposed to perspective. And I, I did a whole video on this because I talked about the yoga, the so-called yoga positions that people are using. And when they make a claim that the Egyptians uh, did yoga in those same positions and, and postures, that's just not true. They're actually looking at a, a artistic style called aspective where um, certain things were done in profile. Certain things were done uh, square on. And, and it was to emphasize multiple angles all at once simultaneously. And so when you see pictures like this, they're not even standing like if 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 they if these two men were were real and standing there. They wouldn't be standing in that position. That's not a representation of an actual posture position like that. And so all of these things are missed. So people miss all of these things because people want to rush and, and play games with arguing back and forth about Kemet and, 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 and whatever else. And that's why I say it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So. You know, just wanted to kind of show you show you all an example. But you're looking at a visual representation of the word um, for brother. OK, so keep that in mind. All right. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, any more questions? Let me see real quick. Um, yep. You got a twin brother question. Why did ancient Remish call Ethiopia Tynetter, uh the land of the gods? Okay, um, Mr. Morpheus asked that question. Question, why did the ancient Remage call Ethiopia Ta Netter, the land of the gods? Okay, so let's um, establish something first, that the modern borders of the country today that we call Ethiopia was not the same in ancient times. So we, so we have to keep that in mind because when we, when we um, retrofit these things on modern demarcations, they're not, uh, they're not a one-for-one exchange all right and you have to understand that ethiopia ethiopia was a name given by the greeks of everything south of egyptos remember the greeks named um east africa by two names egyptos which was close to the mediterranean and then everything below that was called um ethiops from where we get the word ethiopia so they had three words they had all together. They had Libya, Egyptos, and Ethiop, Ethiops, or Ethiops. All right, so that's one. But to get to the answer to your question is that ta Netcher, the word Netcher is a word for resource. Resources, it's the source. But, but today we would say resource. It's where you, you, you re-up. Like when you run out of something and you want to re up on something, you have to go to your resource, your resources. Like we call money resources, like how much, you know, what are your resources? Like you want to you want to perform a job or you got this idea you want to do. Well, how much what, what, what are your resources? So it is the source. It is it is that which you can rely on and as a source. And so the idea of, of something being the source is shared with this word nature. And so when we say ta nature, we're saying the land of resources. But a lot of people will want to say, oh, it's the land of gods. So therefore, the Egyptians saw the Ethiopians as gods. No, it's the land of resources. It's a place where Egypt got plentiful resources from. Ta nature. And it's not always Ethiopia. Like modern day Ethiopia, because punt is also referred to as ta Netcher, the land of Punt. And Punt, you know, people are arguing over exactly where Punt was, but they're saying it's in the Ethiopian, Somali, 
uh, Eritrea area, um, even going all the way down to the on the east coast, down to Kenya, and things of uh, uh, in that area, Uganda, Kenya, and so on and so forth. But one thing for sure that we know is Ta Netcher is talking about the land, Ta land of resources. Just like I could say Sun Netcher, the word Sun Netcher simply means incense. Because it's something that is held high, something that is high and elevated, that is um, important. And because smoke rises up high, incense, when they burn, is called sinetur. Sinetur. And, that, and, and so today we play on that. We say, you know, incense or good perfume or good smells is the scent of the gods. That's why frankincense and myrrh are associated with religious and spiritual rituals in the church they burn frankincense they put it in this little little uh thing that they wave around let the smoke uh go through the church and things like that um people all over they burn sage they burn frankincense myrrh and all kinds of other things but they do it in a spiritual quote-unquote spiritual context and it all ties back to what i'm saying Sinetra, which is which is a um a word that has the word nature in it as well so ta nature is a land of resources it's also a land of importance something that is that it, you rely on and and the connection they tie people try to tie it into god is because people feel that without god you can't do anything and with god all things are possible that's what the christians say with god all things are possible so people think that you cannot live without God. So God is very important and vital to your success. So Ta Netcher, the land of resources, was vital to the to um, at different times to the functioning of of Kemet. Queen, uh, not Queen, excuse me, King Hatshepsut, uh, Omat Ka Ra, she did exposit. Ex expedition to point and, and brought back a lot of goods and things and the whole kingdom thrived after that they went into the ta nature so anyway hopefully that um answers your question so the, so you know a short version of the answer to the point uh why they call it that is because it was resources there that's real simple but i wanted to kind of give you some some context for that uh, okay, so let's go down. Um, okay, still talking about the twin brothers. Oh, he said, aren't those twins, right? They um, they were buried together. They were twins, if I remember correctly. Right, you know, but the, but the whole point I was making about that was, was that it's the actual word for brother. Uh, look up the word sin for brother. You'll see that um, the nose... Is also used, the full part of the of the um, of the face, the nose. All right, but they say that the brothers are kissing. You know, trying to kiss. Like, no, come on now. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, we say brother to refer to the black men in today. Okay, Kemet called Ethiopia Ta Netra God's land. Can you explain why? Okay, I already did that. Um, they called any place of resources Ta Netra. So that's you know that's my point. Land of resources. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Punt is on the horns of Africa below uh, Ethiopia. OK, so took uh, what do you think about polite stance on nature, meaning agent of ancestors? Do you agree? No, I do not agree. I don't know where the brother um, um, got that from. All right. Agent of ancestors. All right. Well, you know, in listening to the explanation, he said Chur is ancestors and N would be an, an agent of. So he puts it together, agent of ancestors. But that's not that's not how the word is broken down. That's not how the word is used. It's not used in any context that way. An agent of the ancestors. That doesn't even make that doesn't make sense. All right. So don't you know, that's that doesn't make sense at all. Nature is. um. It could translate, you know, people translate it differently. Uh, most people translate it as God. But then that you run into a whole ocean of of other problems when you just say God, because God is is a very ambiguous term nowadays. All right. So some people will say divine. 
uh, nature means divine, something that's divine. But then you look up divine. What does divine mean? And you and you back at God, you know, and stuff like that. So it's not something that could be quickly just uh, one word, one sentence type of discussion on that. But overall, the gist of nature is something that is very vital and important. That's why a standard is used, something that is held up high, something that can be seen by all. Something that is very, very important. Or if it was a hierarchy, it would be number one. If it was in a linear line, it would be first. You know, something that is very important. And so what happened is, let me just tell y'all this because y'all, you know, uh, uh, Phi Lighten, Lightentist asked about spirituality or philosophy. Let me just share this. The the entire cast of Netcheru in Egypt or Kemet and this goes for all indigenous cultures the gods and goddesses of all indigenous cultures around the planet are really mnemonic devices that are used as ontological categorical labels for phenomena in existence okay hopefully y'all got that all these deities that you that you see indigenously um, written or spoken about in these various different cultures around the planet. These deities are devices, ancient devices, uh, mnemonic devices to keep in the memory of the people. And they are categorical or ontological categorical labels for various different phenomena that takes place. In nature. That's what it is. So if you want to really understand what I just said, you have to understand ontology and taxonomy. Ontology is is how existence itself is categorized. And taxonomy is used as hierarchical labels and organizing those labels. Like biological taxonomy, this is where you get, you know, homo sapiens, sapien, uh, homo and homo genus and and all those different ranks and things like that, because that's how things are labeled and named. So when you're talking about these various different deities, they're not literal. They're real, but not literal. But they are ontological categorical labels. That's what they are. And and people have to understand it. So collectively, they they are all important. They are they're like the 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 node for those who are into programming, computer programming or or um, maybe engineering. When you create a node, you're 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 creating a, a central point by which other things can tap into and patch into. And so these various different natural, various different deities become nodes for important concepts that that are connected to it and all of them connect to each other and this connection to each other is revealed or expressed by family relationships this is why um osar and oset can be either brother and sister or husband and wife ma'at and jehudi and sashat can be husband and and wives or brothers and sisters and geb and nut shu tefnut Atum, all these different relationships, it, it forms a familial hierarchy a family and a family is simply a relationship structure there. These are not literal people or anything like that. They're showing you the connection between these these categorical labels. And these are high end labels that have multiple sub domains under them. And so we have to, you know, have this understanding, like, for example, Jehudi is the ultimate conflict resolutionist. This is why in the mythos, in the stories, Jehudi is the one who solves all the problems. Everybody goes to Jehudi. They call him the deity of wisdom because because he's able to solve problems. Not by creating new problems, because sometimes it's easy to solve a problem. But when you solve one problem in you solving that problem, you created a new problem. Well, Jehudi um, is the deity of wisdom because um, that deity governs the aspect of conflict resolution without creating another conflict or problem solving without creating another problem. 
In other words, in the medical field, it would be to administer medicine without having an adverse side effect. So that's what people are going to have to understand. People are going to have to understand that first and foremost, that all these various different deities and all these different cultures are ontological labels for for various different phenomenon in existence on multiple levels. On a personal level, what takes place with a person in the human being, what takes place in the community and what takes place globally and what takes place cosmically, like what they see transpiring in the sky. Multiple labels simultaneously. That's what these various different deities govern. Without that understanding, then you're going to be all lost in the sauce, thinking that Asar was a real person. Um, you know, it just goes for any any culture. You could go over to uh, Nigeria. You could you could think that Obatala was a real person, came down on a, on a chain, you know, from um, Olorun or, or or you know, uh, coming down and and doing this, that, and a third. You know, and, and think these things are real or literal and they're not. All right. So so people going to have to. Um, going to have to understand that. All right. So I'm, I'm looking again, you know, <laughs> this video is definitely a lot longer than I, than I anticipated, but this is all good. You know, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, well, y'all is the first person to say this name correctly. People mess it up all the time. Oh, Philistentus. Oh, Philistentus. I I don't I don't know. I don't remember how <laughs> how I pronounced it correctly. Which way I did. Um. Uh, let's see. Okay, Tony Mason. Please explain the tale of Seth and Ho Horus. Seth let his member become stiff, and he inserted it between the thighs of Horus, and Horus placed his hands between the thighs and caught the semen of Seth. Okay, I will, we, we're going to save that for another video because in order to explain it, you got to read the entire story and you have to understand the context of the story. And that's the problem that I see Hebrew Israelites do when they try to use it against, you know, quote unquote, practitioners of, of Kemet, the Kemetics that they be battling and arguing and, and fussing with. They try to use that story of the lettuce and Heru and Stuk, and they try to use that story and say, see, uh, Kemet is gay, homosexuality. But they have no interest in, in, in understanding the, um, um, what all that really, really means. But that's a whole discussion. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm running from it because it's old. Like, listen, man, Kemet on trial, that was what, 2014, 2015? And we're here in 2019, whatever the case is. All those topics are old. We've addressed it all before. Uh, the brother Jonathan Owens, uh, the Magi, he addressed it. Uh, he 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 addressed it in a more focused way um, over over the years. So you know, I don't want to make it seem like I'm running from that topic, but you can't. Like I'm at the tail end of this video, and I don't want to bring that up uh, to discuss that. That's a long. That's a long thing. As, but but it, it's necessary. So, you know, I appreciate you asking the question, but I think that I think that it needs to be um, fully, fully treated on. So so I don't want to do it injustice by just quickly talking about it. But I'm going to tell you, it's not it's not something about gayness and things like that. You got to understand the culture. You got to understand the 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 culture. And there's a lot of things that go along with that. Just just to give you a, a gist of it. Um, Heru represents the youth, the upcoming youth. Satuk is the um, rifle or what appears to be the heir or heir of the throne, being the oldest, the uncle of uh, Wasir. And so the relationship between the elders and the youth are bore out in that particular story about the two way street between eldership and the youth. And how that relationship is forged and the outcome. That along with um, what those different things mean uh, in those different times. It's not, it has nothing to do with homosexuality or gayness. All right. So, but we can get into that. All right. Um, all right let's see. Let's go back. Uh, okay. Marcel says, what, what, where are you getting that from? Uh, 
Oh, oh, he must be asking. Okay, talking to someone else in the, in the group. All right. Uh, so, so text says uh, the Netru have been likened to the Orisha. Was there one supreme being for the entire culture, like Olo Dumare, or the different gnomes have different supreme deities? Okay, so we have to understand that. Um, in a lot of these cultures, the the ultimate supreme being is existence itself. Never forget that existence itself is the ultimate being and we got to understand what we mean by being and when we say supreme being it's not supreme because nothing because super means above or beyond there's nothing outside of existence itself so when we say supreme being we're talking about existence itself and we can only differentiate by saying supreme is because we also have beings so we have a supreme being and then we have beings. And so we have existence itself. And then we have um, that which con existence consists of. Which are which are our entities we call beings. And so what we really have going on is a macro and micro simultaneous existence. So we have unity and multiplicity at the same time or multiplicity within the unity and so the multiplicity we say beings and then the unity or the or the or the macro is the supreme being and so these indigenous cultures uh many of them um understood this principle and so they have words that kind of create this compare and contrast but what people have done is that they they anthropomorphize these concepts and think that they are like literal and that they are not simultaneously matched up with something else so like for example in the abrahamic traditions the god of those traditions and, and belief systems is outside of existence outside of creation because if when you read the um the torah or the bible or the quran allah or elo or elohim or Yehovah, or Jehovah, or God, or Christ, or the Messiah, whatever. When that deity creates, it creates, and then it goes somewhere else and chills. So that deity is outside of creation. But in Africa, in most African communities, indigenous populations, they understood that, that the creator and creation are one and the same. It's one and the same. And there's nothing outside of it. But in order to express these principles and concepts, they, they created a structure. And that's what I meant by the Neturu are ontological categorical labels to to kind of structure this. To define things. All right. And we have to understand that. So in the story, so be to be more specific in the story, um, there's a book. There's a text called the uh, Knowing the Transformations of Ra and Overthrowing of a Pep. I recommend everybody to get that story, uh, get that. Even if it, even in English, read it, at least read it to, to kind of digest it. It's called the Book of Knowing the Transformations of Ra and Overthrowing a Pep. OK, it is a text. And um, in that text, it explains how things come into existence. And so when you express these things, they they give the totality of everything, uh, the moniker neb -er or neb -er as people say. But it's actually three words, neb er -cher, or jer. And neb means owner or possessor. Er is, um, is to or towards or regarding to. And then jer is, means limit. And so what that phrase or moniker is saying is that that the supreme being is the owner of all of the limits. And you can't get anything above and beyond that. So neb -er -cher is referred to as the supreme being. But the text is about Ra and how Ra transforms of itself to become the things in the world 
and as the world itself. And so this unfolding and this constant unfolding and becoming and coming into existence is expressed by the word Kepper. The beetle people are familiar with. The word Kepper means to evolve, to come into being, to change, to become. And so in this text, you're going to see Kepper used a lot of times, a whole bunch of times. So I'm like a tongue twister. Kepper, Kepperu, Kepperi, Kepperu, Kepperra. You're going to see all forms of that word Kepper being used back to back to back to back to back because it's explaining this unfolding of existence, how things come into existence from come from nothing and to become something. And even the nothing is technically a something. And this is how this is just how they expressed it. So they use these different deities to express all of these things, not so much as in a supreme like, uh, uh, you know, the supreme being in, in a sense of of like how the abrahamic sense you know so so you know like i said we just have to keep all of that in mind you know because we have different things because you asked the question about supreme being or the dip or the different gnomes have a supreme being and so i don't want to just answer yes or no i want you to understand that the various different neturu in kemet no matter where you are in kemet they are re relative to whatever is being expressed. So you may have at the top of a, of a particular hierarchy, um, Atum. At the top of another particular hierarchy, you may have Ptah. At another hierarchy, you may have Kanum at the, at, the, at the apex. And so, but it doesn't mean that Kanum is the supreme being to those people or Ptah is supreme being or Atum is supreme being. It's just a hierarchy, a system, a, 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 um, what do you call it? A, a way to express a system and their relationships. Because remember, nothing in existence exists in and of itself. Everything in existence is related, is relative. It's related to something else. All right. So hopefully that's uh, that's understood. All right. So hopefully, I mean, I'm not sure if I answered, but, you know, I'm trying to answer in a way to where I don't have to be too uh, long winded with it, because the, those are kind of topics that we discuss. Um, after, you know, there's a lot of prerequisite stuff that people need to know for for that, for, you know, that kind of discussion to really, really be fruitful. All right. And so I avoid that in a setting like this um, because my my focus in the in the public is to raise an army of scribes is to educate people on the language so that you people can discern the text because like i said there's a lot of misinformation out there and and, and if you can't back it up by the by the various different texts like i gave you a name of a text the book of knowing the transformation of rod and overthrowing of a pep even if you can't read the glyphs or anything like that at least read the english translation to get it under your belt just read it just become familiar with it just like the book of the dead um people read it and just get it and then you'll understand later after you learn a lot of things you'll understand that the book of the dead i mean i mean everybody pretty much knows not not the book of the dead like the dead people don't have any reason to um have books because dead people don't read or eat or any of that kind of stuff um but a lot of people are familiar with the phrase um uh, heru. But the more fuller name of it is the Rauniu Peret Emheru, which are the utterances for coming forth um, by day, as they say, or whatnot. But it's really an ancestral ancestralization uh, manual that comes at the end of a person's life. But during a person's life, it's it's a, a initiatory manual. All right. It's, it's that's basically that's what it is. And these are things that were done, performed and understood um ritualistically from coming from temple uh courses that people were involved with all right but you won't even get to that point and understand it you know without having the ability to discern you're gonna read it and think you know you got talking snakes you got you know all kinds of stuff in there all right so let's uh let's go some more um uh let's see Okay, see, I knew I wasn't the only one that saw that connection. Okay, different periods held different Netru as the chief, but the supreme will always be Nun 
to me. I don't see how it couldn't when all things literally came forth from it other other than ma'at. Um see again, we just yeah, I understand what you're what you're saying about that, but we just gotta be mindful and careful when we say that. Because nun or nini or nun or nu would be the undifferentiated substance from which everything came out of it. But you got to understand that nothing comes out of something. What what really goes on, like when we say chaos and order, they're really the same. Two ends of the same stick, I should say. Um, chaos just simply means unformed. You know, has no form, it's formless. And order means something that has form. And what causes something to be formless versus having form? Okay, you have to come from a perspective of, of existence itself being infinite and eternal. There's nothing outside of existence, okay? So understand that. Everything that exists, exists. Everything that will ever exist, exists. And so the reason why something becomes new to you or that you become aware of it is because you are touching it. Okay, you are touching it. It comes into your sphere of awareness and we call that perception. If you never perceive something, then it does not exist to you. And so that 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 moment of perception when something goes from beyond the line of your perception and it crosses that line and now at the snap that mo that exact moment that you you become aware all right there's a there's a thunderstorm going on <laughs> around and i'm gonna probably have definitely have to end this video a little bit early because uh it looks like the power is is flashing and everything i don't know if i don't know if you all heard that that noise that was that was a huge uh, thunder um, going on. So let me just quickly kind of wrap this up a bit. So let me just finish what I was saying. So 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 that moment that you um, that you perceive something, that exact exact moment, that is when something is created to you. It's based on you, your your perception of something. Okay, and so this process is what takes place. So you are the ultimate creator. Because it's based on your perception when things comes in into your sphere. And you got to understand that when a thing becomes a thing, all you're really saying is that now you're able to di differentiate it from from something else. And, and when you can differentiate something from something else, you are defining it. When you look up the word definition or the word define, it simply means to place a limit around something to to make it distinct from something else. And again, the Egyptians expressed this very eloquently, very ingenious. They referred to this process or the ultimate aspect of this um, as Neb Urcher, which is the owner of all of these limits. Remember, when you define something, you're putting a limit around something. And if you own all of those definitions, all of those limits, then that is the ultimate or supreme being. And that's what is being conveyed in that in that story. But how things become is by way of Ra transforming of itself to become the things in the world and as the world itself. So Ra, so everything you see is a transformation of Ra becoming what it is. So, so it enters into these limitations called definitions and it becomes a thing an entity, a substance. And we name these things and we call those substantives or in English, we call them nouns. And we say nouns are persons, places and things or ideas and concepts because it could be a, a tangible object or an intangible object, but it's still an entity. And these entities come into existence based on our perception. And so, like I said, it's, it's, um, it could get very, very intricate and everything, but there's a lot that people have to, um, understand to be able to kind of walk through uh 
uh, that. So I don't want to get too long. And plus, you know, like I said, it's it's uh, storming out here. Uh, let's just let me go go through these real quickly. Uh, um, Tony Mason said, "Yeah, I know it's old. He made a video saying you guys were running at Kimmon on trial from that question. He, I'm not sure who who he is, but now nobody ran from that question. It's it's real silly. It's real silly. You know, I don't know uh, uh, Tony Mason. I'm not sure who you're talking about, but um, yeah. Uh, no, nobody runs from that. It's it's uh." You know, nobody runs from that. Uh, let's see. Nebuchadnezzar, I figured that was the Supreme. Uh, understood. I follow you. Thanks for the breakdown. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, oh, could Nun be existence itself? Now, Nun, Nun is is an expression of this. of this. That's why they call it the watery abyss. It's, it's given an analogy to water. The reason why is because water itself can take the shape of anything that it, that contains it. And so it's very, very flexible. Water, water has the ability to become whatever. And so water represents this concept of, of, of this infinite potentiality. And so nun or nini, which is this inertness, this inner inertness that has the, has the potential to become any and everything is what's being expressed. And so nun is, is describing an aspect of existence and and the processes that take place not existence in and of itself okay but now notice this that new is the inverse of when when the word when means to be or to exist and new is the inverse is an inverse of that so i'll leave y'all with that you know um, but like i said there's a lot that could be discussed about this um but i don't like i said you know um it's better for people to really, really prepare and, and, and get some other things under their belt before trying to have uh, these kind of discussions. But anyway, the purpose of today's video, I know I kind of went long and everything, was to address um, our good brother Asarim Ka or Adrian uh, claims. And really his misunderstanding is, is it was real simple. If he just understood that nation is talking about people, then he really shouldn't have a problem with how I define um that word, that particular word, Kemet, as the nation of Kemet. It's talking about the people in an abstract sense, as an abstract entity. Okay? Because, see, just, just real quick about that. Um, if, if I say America goes to war with Iraq, now we know good and well that America, the, uh, uh, a physical geographical land, does not pick up a gun or pick up weapons and march over to another geographical uh, physical territory land called Iraq and fight each other. So when we say America is going to war or fighting Iraq, what we are doing essentially in English is personifying the nation. We're referring to an abstract aspect of, a na of the nation, of people. This is called national personification. Okay? Like, I'll give you another example. Uncle Sam. What does Uncle Sam represent? Uncle Sam represents the government. It's the personification of the government. What is the government? The government is a bunch of people. The government is not some, you know, this, this random entity or machine. The government is a bunch of people. And those people are personified and anthropomorphized into a man with a hat, a beard, wearing red, white, and blue. And we call Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam wants you. You know, we say those things. So people got to understand these things are normal. We use it every day, all day. It's just that we, we, we may not know what it's called and know, know how to use it outside of, you know, the way we grew up. But Kemet, in that sense, is an ancient way of doing the exact same thing. This is why Kemet can fight. I could show you text where you'll see um, the personification of, 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 of things, you know? So keep, keep all that in mind. Okay, 40, 42 tribes, you got the last question. It says, can I ask an off-topic question? Uh, sure, go ahead. I know there's, I know there's, uh, there's a delay, but you'll, you'll be the last question, then I'm going to wrap it up. So while you're typing your question, I'm just going, you know, just reiterate, you know, the purpose of this, this video was to address that 
And hopefully people um, were able to take away something from here, uh, from this particular video. And um, and learn something. And, and again, if you have questions after this, you know, join our Facebook group. Set your mind, email, and at your Facebook group. Post your questions or comments or whatever the case is there. All right, we welcome it. It's our Facebook group. The same name you see on our YouTube channel right here, below this video, Seshu Mindy Metanature. Type that in the Facebook, and you'll find find our Facebook group. Matter of fact, we got the link. We have the link in the description. Um, the link is in the description. Click the link and then join the group. Okay, Forty Two Tribe says, "Can anyone give me primary examples of why Egypt was so anthropomorphic?" anthropomorphize uh kind of explain your question i'm not i'm not i don't quite understand what you mean with your question yeah if you if you can um maybe reword your question and then you know i, I don't understand i don't want to i don't want to um try to answer something i don't quite understand yet okay he says um whatever it is to explain the use of animals in the culture okay well if i understand your your question correctly um by anthropomorphize you, you when you say animals now anthro is man so you kind of confusing me with the with the animal creatures type of statement and then man because anthro anthropomorphize is to is to you know kind of bring things into into the likeness of of um of man you know humans but but anyway let me just attempt to answer your question because uh, like i said it's storming out here um this is the thing you have to understand that um writing that we take for granted and it's a luxury to us today we're, we're born into into the world of writing like everybody around around us uh writes but we have to understand that writing was invented approximately 5,000 ish years ago now humanity is way older than 5,000 years so writing in respect to uh, humans or humanity's existence is very, 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 very young. In comparison, it's like writing was invented yesterday. Okay, having said that, we have to understand that in order for a community of people to record information and store it for, for future generations to be able to pass it from generation to generation to generation without having the 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 new generation to start from scratch again because imagine this everything that we eat today in terms of what we consume as food good and bad what's healthy and unhealthy everything we eat today comes from somewhere along the line somebody in humanity had to die to experiment to figure out what what was edible and what's not like imagine the very very first person to eat any particular thing do you know how challenging that is like you've never eaten it before and you don't know anybody else in the world who has ever eaten this object and you pick it up and you're going to take a chance like everything was taking a chance first you're going to observe if animals eat it you're going to be like okay well if the animals can eat it then maybe i can eat it but that's not a guarantee either because animals digestive system and, and bodies are made different from humans. So that's not a guarantee. But at least at least, you know, you kind of in the ballpark, you, you're going to wait for an animal to eat something before you eat it. But anyway, my point, though, is that imagine going through a bunch of trial and errors of finding out what to eat and then not being able to pass that on to the next generation. And then the, the, the future next generation has to do the same thing. Do you understand how backwards we would be? So there has to be a way to record and log information. And so how did they do it? If writing didn't exist until 5,000 years ago, how did humanity survive and pass on and record and log information? 
Where's the body of information, the reservoir of information? So what I'm getting at is that ancient peoples invented very, very ingenious ways to store information. And we called, we got names for all this kind of stuff, like, like figurative speech, metaphors. See, we take it for granted, but metaphors was an invention. That's a, that's a technology. Myth is a technology. Um, hyperboles, uh, analogies, similes, all these different figurative expressions are, are ancient technologies that had to, to be invented just to store information. And so what I'm getting at is that when you, when you ask about why things are anthropomorphized or, or put into animals and this, that, and the other, these are mechanisms or, or tools by which the people can use to record information. And so with the hieroglyphic writing system, if you notice that all of the pictorial glyphs themselves, they're actual objects that were familiar in the Nile Valley area, you know, taken from the flora and fauna and even some man-made objects from the Nile Valley area. And they were used to visually represent speech. And so likewise, the common speech was represented by utilizing objects, then fuller high, uh, high ended concepts were also represented by visible objects in the form of figures of human, human beings and figures of animals and whatnot. So if now you ask, uh, can we give primary, some primary examples of why this is? And so I'm giving you the, 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 why as a necessity of how information was transmitted throughout the generations. So one of the ways was outside of what I already explained is what's called the tying of knots. And so what happened was people would encode information in a form of a sequence of knots in a rope. And only those who are familiar with the encoding, they were able to decode it and unpack it. It's, it's almost like having concentrated um, lemonade powder where you have lemonade powder. You've got to add water to make it into lemonade again. So, so, so you take orange juice, you dehydrate it into powder, and then, and then later on you package it and you can add water again. And then voila, you got orange juice again. So what happens is if, uh, a wealth of information can be compacted into a sequence of knots and encoded. And then someone comes along and decodes it and unpacks it back into the full story. That's what myths and things represent literally, you know, in terms of literature. But prior to that, it was a tying of knots. And in fact, the very glyph for a knot, a, a tied knot in the Egyptian language is a word for wisdom. The tying of knots. And so these sequence of knots, you had to be trained. You had to know how to encode and decode them. And I know that's not related to animals directly, but I'm saying these are various different mechanisms, ways in which information was stored and transmitted. So anth anthropomorphizing different things was a was a method. And also the use of animals and plants and all these other kinds of things was used as well. All right. So you have to just understand those things. And because animals are remember humans are animals and animals are are things that can move on its own volition that's that's what separates the animal kingdom from the plant kingdom animals are are um simply a way this is where we get the word animation from to animate something is to move be able to move and plants can't move on their own that's why they're not called animals Animals are called animals because they can move on their own and human beings. We move on our own volition. Therefore, we are also animals. And so the animal creatures that we call animals versus the human animals are separated even further based on community, intellect and, and, and culture, all those other kinds of things. But the ancient Egyptians utilized both to convey information, to store information and all the likes. So. I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe I, I don't I don't know if I understood your um, your question. Um, 
that's what I got from your question to to respond that way. But you said uh, like the way we see it with the Sphinx and Heru. It was the wrong word. Okay, is there anything in writing where they talk about why Heru has the head of an animal or what the Empu Empu dog represents? Why it has? No, not if you're okay. If you're asking for something specifically spelled out where it's explicit and said, and they, and you got a text that says Heru has the head of a falcon because blah 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 blah. The answer is no. You won't find that. All right. So there's there's a level of deduction that has to be done because there's a there's a there's a a inert or innate familiarity with the culture that you have to have um, to be able to understand that. And that, and that a context builds that up for you. But no, there was no literal person, you know, human body in a, in a falcon head or whatever the case is. Okay, or the dog, uh, Enpu, um, and Wapwawet having a canine head, um, nothing saying exactly why. All right, but we know why, you know, you like I'm saying, to answer your question, you're asking for explicit uh, uh, text that will say so. No. Nah. So now nah, you won't get that. But listen, the deities, uh, remember, remember, the Egyptians didn't define their deities either in terms of a, li a dictionary list. Like they didn't say, Wasir means this, Ptah means this, Kanun means this, Heru means this. They didn't do that. They define a lot of these de deities in, in all these indigenous cultures. They're defined by their placement within the stories. If you know how they function within these myths, and what they did and did not do and how they interacted with this, that, or the third, that defines them. Okay, like Hut Heru and Heru. Like Hut Heru or what people call Hathor has Heru in her name. Hut is a domain or abode. And Heru would be, if you leave it unpacked, I mean, if you leave it packed, it'd be Heru. So the, the abode or the domain of Heru. But what is Heru? Her or Heru is, is, is means a distance. The distant one. So the abode of the distant one. What is the distant one? And where is the abode? What was distant was the sun. And the sun is in the abode of the sky. And so you get this heavenly cow association with, he, with Heru as a, a heifer or cow or calf. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you get this this celestial cow and the sun traveling on its back, being that the sun is the distant one traveling through its abode, which is the sky, so on and so forth. So you 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 know you start to be able to define things based on a fuller context of, of information. That's why I say none of this can be microwaved, none of this can be just picked up and people get the cliff notes and things. That's why what we do here um, in terms of the Seshumani Metanature group and what I do as a teacher and things, I do things very systematically, very procedurally and methodically. And people, you know, we walk through a process just like any other initiate initiatory system. Step one, step two, step three, step four, so on and so forth. All right. So that's what has to be understood. All right. And people have to have to get that like all set or Nebit Hood, her, her sister, Nebit Hood or Nephthys is how, you know, a lot of people know it from the Greek pronunciation. But Nebit Hood, Nebit or Nebet means owner. And it's a feminine form. So it's a female owner. And then Hood, Nebit Hood, no, Nebit Hood is an abode again, a temple or or. Or an abode, an enclosure, an estate. So she's the owner of the abode. What abode? And why is it that Nebit Hut and Oset, when you see them in the iconography, in a funerary scene, they're at they're at the feet and the head of the deceased person. And 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 so you gotta 
understand the fuller context of their role and what they do and so on and so forth. And you got to remember the story, like for the, the story that a lot of people are familiar with is the uh, death and resurrection of Osiris. OK, and in just Osiris was the king of Egypt or Kemet. He goes on an expedition, a teaching mission. He goes out to, to domesticate and civilize other other people, other places. And while he's gone, he leaves the kingdom in charge of his wife, sister, wife, Isis or Aset. Um, but his uncle is there. I mean, not his uncle, his brother is there who is took. That's his brother. His brother's envious and he wants to be in charge and so on and so forth. Um, so when. Uh, Wasir returns home, they give a banquet and celebrate his return. Satuk tricks him and gives him a gift of a coffin. Uh, built exactly to his dimension of his body, so on and so forth. And he basically uh, uh, tricks him by saying, whoever can fit it, you know, it's theirs, blah, blah. So when Os Osir gets in the coffin, they seal him up and they throw him into the river. All right. Um, so long story short, um, they kill him. So Satuk and his conspirators kill his brother, Wasir. Osir has to run. In hiding and before that she mourns her father's um not her father sorry her husband's death and she goes into mourning she is consulted by nebit hut and so Osset represents the aspect of mourning for a loss and really a mourning for a loss is is really the coming to realization of something that is missing. The side effect of that realization is to mourn. Nebit Hood, her sister, represents the side of that to rejoice, to be joyful. And so at funerals to this very day, you have people who mourn and people who celebrate. To this very day. You got both of those things going on at the same funeral or, or, you know, the funeral festivities. People cry, mourn, and you even hire professional mourners. In some cases. To do that. But then they rejoice there by eating, everybody talking, joking, uh, playing music. They're celebrating the transition of their loved one. OK, so it's represented by these two women. And so these two women becomes archi archetypes for um this entire process that i'm talking about so in kemet you had women who became professional mourners and the husband i mean excuse me the wife or the sister of the deceased would 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 play the role of offset and or and or nebit hut and they would be at the head and the foot at the deceased uh person and so that you could represent you could see these in the, uh, different papyri As a matter of fact the pap papyrus of annie um and who nefer and all those you if you look at the funerary uh, procession at the end at the grave site you'll see the um close relative the female relative um bowing at the feet of the deceased person and so what i'm saying though is that a lot of these different deities are defined by their function and role in these different stories you're not going to find a, a a explicit dictionary where the egyptians say the name Is isis means this or Nebit means this and, and Pata means this and so on and so forth. You have to deduce that by reading about their functionality in these various different stories. Satuk, for example, Satuk gets his bad rap as, as somebody who is like, you know, you raise your eyebrow against and kind of be against. It's due to the to how he was born. OK, and but you got to understand all these things to be able to define them. So Satuk was born. You got to remember Satuk. Um, if you walk back up to the, um, the genealogy, you have uh, Shu and then Tefnut. They're 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 two opposite phenomena. Shu represents dryness and Tefnut represents moisture, um, which are really the two aspects of coughing and sneezing. Coughing is is an ejaculation of air and sneezing is an ejaculation of moisture. So Shu and even in the story it says that I have coughed up or I sneezed Tefnut. The word Tefnut means to spit moisture. 
tiff. It means to spit. But anyway, so you have this shu tefnut. And then from there you have geb and nut. Now notice how we have pairs. Shu tefnut, a pair. Geb nut, a pair. Then you have um aset and wasir as a pair. But then here comes this third entity coming out to disrupt that system of pairness, and that's the took. And when you read the text about how he was born, they don't describe his birth like they do the others. His birth was like a rupture in the side of his mother, whereas everybody else was born. A different word was used instead of the word mess, which means to give birth. Uh, messy to, to give birth or born a different word was used for Satuk's uh, coming into into life and that's a demonstration to show that he's the disruptor he's the he is the one that caused chaos he's the one that disrupts a system and so he became known as the system disruptor or the chaotic one that's why he got associated with the with the area of chaos called the desert and all the stories around him okay so we got to understand these things in order to to fully appreciate um these deities and and the metaphors and the figurative speech uh expressions about them so i'm just giving you example yeah uh, somebody said a c-section if you want to call it that <laughs> that'd be something that we, we would we would uh call it today so took so took came out the side he poked his way out he forced his way out and a similar story in the bible by the way uh with that with uh, esau and jacob notice this though now i'm not now listen you know i'm not i'm not trying to say something that i'm not saying so i'm not i don't do the innuendos right but just just i just find this interesting right what i just described and that's a story you could read in kemet now you you could read it matter of fact i'll, I'll reshare it in the in our group um, about the birth of Satuk. Satuk was born out the, out of force. Like he forced his way out. He was not patient. And so you got people that are like that. You know, impatient people who force them ways, force themselves into a situation and disrupt the order and the flow of things. Those are called Setians. And Satuk disrupted the um the flow of the kingdom by killing his brother, who was the who was the king, prosperous king, killed him and then and then ruled the people in a in a very negative uh way. But anyway, but Satuk is associated with the color red. OK, because he's associated with the color red and also uh, white, you know, white and red. He's associated with chaos. He's associated with disruption and, you know, all those kinds of things. All right. Negative connotations. And see, you see how he's born. But notice that in the Bible, it's, it's like a similar story with Esau and Jacob. And one of them, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Esau was identified with some red color. And he got his name changed to red, Edom, red. That's interesting. But anyway, you know, so back to this, though. Um, but yeah, so so I'm only giving this example of, of how you go about deducing the the reasons and and meanings behind various different deities they are they are defined and qualified by the roles they play within these myths so you got to be very familiar with the with the stories all right you got to be very familiar with the, with these uh stories okay so uh that's what i would uh, recommend okay uh brother sanjeti uh nebit owner yep and neb nebit is a uh, um, feminine form of neb neb owner possessor and nebit is the feminine form this is a personal man or woman who is the head of an estate, property, home, institution. Exactly. So we have Nebit Hood. All right. So just wanted to um, offer a couple of those things to you all. Uh, another one. I give you another example. Uh, let's talk. Let's talk about. Let's let's mention the deity Sekhmet. Sekhmet is a feline uh, lioness deity. You know, she's a fe female with a uh, head of a lion or lioness. Um. And a lot of people are familiar with her. Uh, her name Sekhem is she, her name Sekhmet is the feminine form of the word Sekhem, which means power. And 
Now, there's different notions of power. Like in English, we got one word power, P-O-W-E-R, power. But in other languages, there's different aspects of power. So you got dominion, you got power as in a force, then you have power as in a potential. You, you know, you got all kinds of different things. But Sekhmet, for example, if you want to know more about her role or what she means or what it what it her domain covers and stuff, you can read the story of, of stories. So one story in particular is um, where Ra is trying to get some good rest and sleep and he's constantly being disturbed by some folks, some human beings. So he gets tired of it and he wants something done about that. He wants the people to be quiet. And so he sends his daughter, which is Sekhmet, um, down to, t to handle business. So she goes down, finds out who's making the ruckus, who's making the noise, and she kills him. Okay. But she becomes bloodthirsty and she starts killing innocent people as well. Then Ra has to be like, oh, snap, um, you know, I wanted you to calm everything down, but I didn't want you to just go ahead on a mass murder escapade. So, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story, by the way. So then Ra um, comes up with the idea to um, because she's bloodthirsty. So he tricks her into drinking wine, thinking it's blood to get her intoxicated so she could pass out. So she becomes drunk, pass out, calms down comes back home and then everything's all good okay so and now i know i, I gave i gave the uh the cliff note <laughs> paraphrase version of that story but i would suggest you read it <clears throat> um but what you can get from the whole story not my not my paraphrase version but the whole story <clears throat> excuse me is an aspect of what that can correlate to so Sekhmet being uh, the powerful one or she who is uh, powerful uh, going to kill or kill off something that disturbs Ra. You, you have to kind of know what Ra represents and know what she represents in order to understand the fuller story of what this all can represent. All right. And so you can correlate it to the fact that Sekhmet is the patroness she is the the head deity of medical physicians okay all the medical physicians in the language is called the sunu the sunu all are under sekhmet just like all of the scribes the seshu are under jehudi okay so jehudi is over all the scribes sekhmet is over all of the medical physicians but why is that so in that story, you can see how Sekhmet can be correlated to a relationship between the human being's health and vitality, the life force within a human being, being disturbed by microbes, invading microbes, or whatever the case is, and then something being sent to kill those microbes, but gets out of hand and kills the healthy parts of the body and and can become potentially fatal and destroy the whole person and so something has to be administered to deter that taking place so things can calm down and come back to normal and so you have white blood cells that will seek out different um, invaders of the body that will destroy it but if white blood cells get too plentiful and out of hand we call it cancer. We call it, you know, all kinds of other kinds of things and it can destroy the body. So you have to administer medicine or whatever the case is to calm things down and to bring things back to an, an, an uh, balanced state. What happens when you get sick? What happens when you get an infection? The f one of the first things that the body reacts to in, in an infection, infection is to raise your body temperature. Your body temperature rises. We call it a fever today. But that's your body's natural reaction. So we're supposed to have fevers, but your fever is supposed to break. That's what we call breaking the fever. But a fever it, in and of itself is a natural and healthy reaction. It's just that it's not supposed to go above a certain amount that could become fatal or damaging. But your body increases its temperature <clears throat> to aid in fighting off the infection or whatever 
the case is. But if left unchecked and goes out of hand, it can kill you. And so um, and all this is medical stuff. This is why I, I said Sekhmet is the, the patroness deity over over the medical physicians. And so when you read the story, you can liken it to, to these various different things. Ra in that place represents the totality of the life force. This life force has this um, similarity to the, vi the vitality that the sun provides for sustenance and life on the planet. All right. So anyway, you all just got to read that story and get get into it. But I'm just giving you a couple of examples in just uh, in a short way to give you examples of how you start to define and see these different deities. They remember, as I said in the beginning, all the various different natural all the deities of, of all indigenous cultures are really ontological categorical labels for various phenomena in nature. They're not literal human beings that walk the earth that came from another planet, land here in a spaceship and had children and do, do this, that, and the third. No, they are an ancient way of labeling existence and categorizing it so that it could be understood and mapped out and added on to throughout the generations. That's why different deities are added on, added on. You know, Kemet, Kemet didn't start off with all the deities that it had, like all at one time. Like it, nobody woke up and said, okay, we got a thousand, we got, you know, 10,000 deities. Here you go. No, deities were invented and created and plugged into the hierarchical system of, 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 of their body of knowledge at all times. All right. But people look at it as, oh, see, because when you have this monotheistic mindset, you think in one God, supreme God and whatnot. And then they they had to borrow deities from other cultures. No, that's why Kemet was so easily able to just incorporate a deity, because if you are a foreign group of people and you and you develop a, a community within a community and you have an understanding of a phenomenon and you name it something, then then there's no problem of adopting that and plugging that into the greater system. And that's what happened. It's no need to like copy this and copy that. It's like, okay, well, hey man, okay, so you all study that aspect of phenomena, y'all name it this, that, and the third. Okay, well, we can incorporate that over here because that relates to this over here. You see, so it's not, it's not, it's not the type of thing. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I've definitely been been uh, on a lot longer than I, I anticipated. Let's see, let me see some last minute questions. Um, Sekhmet is associated with red, yes. The color red, that's true. Uh, this is An Angie uh, Monroe says that. Kofi Kesi Akut says, um, they was occupied by Kemet Israel Finkelstein also showed that, so I'm not surprised by the parallels. Oh, okay, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, let's see. True, and that bed of bacteria is usually red too, okay. Uh, Sanjeti, uh, physicians of Sanu, right, would take, uh, the fevers, body heating up in response to pathogens. Exactly. So that, and that's the, and that's the, and that's the whole point. A fever can get out of control, but a fever, what we call a fever is the body's natural response. It, it is the, the natural reaction your body is supposed to have for, um, intrude, intrude, intruding, um, pathogens and, and infections and so on and so forth okay um that's that's what your body's supposed to do but if left unattended or you don't know what to do to guide it through that process you can't break the fever you will um have problems other problems okay so just understand that uh let's see strife uh brother Ben, thank you for sharing your travels. Okay. Oh, I didn't see Brother Ben in here. Oh, I think he's assuming that Ifa Tunde uh, uh, Fayemi. That's our Brother Sanjeti. Uh, there. Uh, let's see. Oh, he said Hotep, ADOS. Exactly. ADOS is all the way. So anyway, all right. There's no more questions. But, uh, you know, I've kind of been uh, long. But, you know, I, I like the interaction. And, and uh, usually I kind of 
have a QA and a and and have people come on so we can have an actual discussion and dialogue uh as well so i didn't set that up this time but you know i'm just addressing you all in the chat i appreciate you all tuning in and i know this is long but at least the beginning part of it addresses the the actual topic um um with the brother uh asarm ka and the confusion and again just to kind of reiterate and to close out uh the confusion is simply is 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 easily corrected if the brother would would just be aware that when we speak of nation we're speaking about the um personification of a group of people in the abstract that's it and so when i say the nation of kemet i'm talking about a app of uh, the people in an abstract way and of Kemet is a prepositional phrase that you're t saying where they belong or where they originate or where they reside. The people of Kemet. It's just that simple. You know, um, I don't you know know how else to to put it. Um, but because of lack of that understanding, the brother uh, feels that the definition of Kemet as the nation of the in that specific instance that I showed the nation of the repairing country was wrong, but that's because of his lack of understanding what a nation is. I read the definition of nation and what it is. Nation is dealing with people. Country is people or the geographical territory. That's where some confusion comes in. All right. The country of Egypt. We're talking about a place. But if I say the nation of Egypt, we're talking about the people. All right. The nation of Islam, the nation of gods and earth, the nation of the five percenters, you know. Um, so we gotta, you know, just keep all that, all that good stuff in mind, nationality, nation, um, all of those things. So I would recommend people to really, really fully dive into the difference and distinctions between, um, ethnicity, nationality, race, nation, country, um, some more technical terms, toponym, ethnonym demonym and um um what else yeah that's pretty much it look into those terms and fully wrap your mind around those and then it'll, it'll be all right last question ni ni you say ka m if i'm pronouncing that correctly just wanted to know how you got the part you spoke about pertaining to knots and the deeper meanings etc uh, respectfully um in the egyptian language we know as rani kemet there are words that are associated well there's words for not that's the word um chess and the glyph that's used to write that is a tied knot and it actually means wisdom and when you read the stories It'll talk about the encoding of wisdom utilizing knots. And this is something that was acknowledged in Kemet itself. And then in today's living traditions in on the continent of Africa, among some communities, they uh, still do this to this very day where they tie knots or they have within their stories. Um, they are familiar with the tying of knots to store information. And, you you know, it's almost like a um, like what bl the blind blind people do in Braille, where you have to run your fingers over and you can understand what you're reading based on where the dots are, how far apart they are from each other, so on and so forth. Well, these knots, depending on how it's tied, you can store information. Um, another example that how it's used today is in the Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts. Um, certain knots are given certain names and they have its its practical utility function but then it also conveys messages as well and that's more the specul speculative side of boy scout knot knots but then you have the operative side of it where you actually use the knots to 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 on rope and and use it for different things but you can send messages by how you tie something and Further, look at how men tie, how we tie our neckties. There's different ways that you tie a tie, even on the neckties, and the different colors of the ties will have certain 
symbolic meanings. If you wear a red tie, it's for this. If you wear a blue tie, it's for that. If you have a, uh, if you go go around three times and tuck it in, it, it's this. It, you do, do it twice, it's that. It's certain things for certain reasons. And so only if you are familiar with the culture and those nuances that you understand or do you even pick up on that. So likewise, the same thing is done with the tying of knots in ancient times prior to writing. Okay, so remember, writing is very, very young. 5,000 years old. They, they, uh, the, the oldest attested writing system is found in, in Kemet and is dated to approximately 3350 BCE. Slightly older than what's attributed to uh, the Mesopotamia area in Sumer. And if you want to check that out, there's a book called um, Visual Language. Uh, get that book and it breaks down and shows you all the different artifacts and things like that. All right. Um, strife. Historically, each cataract gnome identified with S nation of Kemet. These would be ethnic groups today. Uh, okay, I'm trying to understand. I know you're probably typing on your phone, but as I'm trying to say, uh, historically, each cataract or gnome identified with a nation of Kemet. These would be ethnic groups today. Oh, okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I guess you can say that. Because each, well, it, uh, it, it depends, though. I, I, you know, we got to be careful with that, but I, I, I get what you're saying. You know, the, the gnomes. But by the way, a cataract and a gnome, they're not the same, just, just to make sure everyone understands that. A cataract is a disruption in the flow of water. So the cataract, you know, you got the rocks that will disrupt the flow of water. And that's called a cataract. But the gnome or what was indigenously called a sapat is a, um, a, a, a occupy, occupiable uh, space, territory that, that people could live and dwell in and, and had access to water and can function. That's what a sapat is that the Greeks called gnome. And yet the gnome marks, which were called the Emi, Emi Ra or Emi Ur, of whatever you had the governors of these specific sapats or these districts and they were all under the visor the visors who were under the king so they had a higher administrative hierarchy in Kemet one, one one of the first actually you know federated um state or entity called Kemet or Tawib prior etc so anyway I'm gonna close out though I've been I've been going on I could I could do this all night long but I had to have some point and stop you know i thought the storm was going to make me stop but uh the storm that came and went uh but anyway i appreciate y'all tuning in and um yes you know share the video it, it, you know whatever you take away from this video if you got more questions join our facebook group and just put your questions there don't be afraid to interact you know because this this environment that we have is not that adversarial combative environment okay so we don't we don't do that we don't we don't uh, encourage that and whatnot you know, we see it happening and people try to, you know, um, provoke and stuff like that. And if it's not a teaching moment, I don't bother. it. I mean, really, we it, it is so much to learn about Kemet that it's a waste of time to really deal with um, some of these things. So only if it's a it's, if it's um, a teaching moment that can be created out of these issues that, you know, I'll take the time out to address it if I can. Because we can't chase down everything. But there is a lot. We got to be careful. There's a lot of misinformation out there. OK, um, so, you know, be careful. And the best thing is what I encourage. Learn the language. And if you want to learn the language, we um, we have classes. I'm actually going to start a brand new beginners class. So if you are new to the language or you want to brush up on on some self-taught things that you've been engaged in, you know, back in the day or whatever the case is, I will be starting a fresh um, class group and we're going to walk through the entire beginning fundamentals of the language because you got to remember when we're learning ancient Egyptian you're learning two things at once the writing system and the language and a beginner's course always focuses on the the uh, the details of the writing system how it's mapped how it's used how you know all those good things about the writing system that's the foundation and so we, uh, I will be starting a new one um, by the end of June 
So be on the lookout for that. And uh, like I said, join our Facebook group and I'll keep making announcements about that. All right. So just want to um, let everyone know. OK, Omar says, really a waste of time. Uh, well, let me clarify. What I'm saying is what's a waste of time is the drama, the silliness, the immaturity and the f and as a result of all those things, the fussing is a waste of time to engage in that stuff. Like adults don't engage in the immaturity of children, just in general life. We don't do that. Like if you have children, you don't do that. Like we, we, we separate children's things and what children do from adult things, adult business and adult um, things. And so we don't do that. And so what I mean by a waste of time is to, is to um, get drawn into that and 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 become as um immature as all that stuff is a waste of time because you're you're um handicapping you're preventing your own growth and so what i what i say is that when any of that can be utilized as a teaching instrument teaching tool to educate people on then i'll grab it and utilize it other than that i don't really engage in that, in that silliness I'm not going to argue back and forth about somebody um, saying that the Egyptians live with dinosaurs after after explaining it. I'm not going to argue back and forth with somebody saying that there was flying saucers and UFOs in Egypt. I'm not going to argue with um, whether or not human beings really had dog heads or falcon heads and stuff after explaining. It. See, you make it a teaching moment, but to keep reiterating different things year after year after year, it becomes a waste of time. So that's why we write. We write things so that we can refer. So if somebody, like, for example, if somebody bring up the UFO thing, I wrote an article years ago. So now I don't have to engage in it. I just point to the article. I say, hey, here, here's a link. Read that and get back to me. Somebody point out dinosaurs in Egypt. Hey, read that. And 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 that's what I'm saying about this particular book um, project. Uh, this one here. Oh, you all can't see it on the screen. Oh, y'all been looking at the same thing the whole time. Um, our particular book, we, we're we're writing a, a full, full treatment on this topic about the place, the meaning of the place named Kemet. Once that is written, anytime it comes up, we just point to the book. That's why we write. That's why people write articles. That's why, you know, people log and document things so that we don't so we can continue the work while not being held back by people who are just coming into whatever information for whatever reason, whether it's good, bad or indifferent doesn't matter all right so that's what i mean so i don't mean you know waste of time as in um you know we just forget about everybody don't educate anybody i'm not saying that if, if, if that's what you thought i meant so i just want to clarify that all right uh strife i'll be tuned in never have facebook but i've been thinking okay yeah yeah join facebook well i don't want to tell you that because you might get swallowed up in the in the facebook uh, but Strife, go ahead and ask your, ask your question because, you know, I don't do this uh, that often right now because, like I said, I'm, I'm working on a couple of things. So while I'm here, I was going to get off earlier because of the storm. But go ahead and ask your question. And I know earlier I said that was the last question earlier. I've been reading the story of, of Isis, Osiris. I mean, yeah, Osiris, Isis translated. And they refer to Byblos as being the oldest city. I think maybe I need to hunt down the primary and present it to you all. See if it can be revised. Uh, Biblos being the oldest city. Yeah, you have to dig that up. All right, because uh, Biblos is definitely not the oldest city. Um, but, you know, dig that up so we can look at it because, I, you know, I'm not I can't address it if I'm not looking at it or whatever. All right. So. So, yeah, dig that up. But uh, if you dig it up, if you if you already on the um, in our Facebook group, yeah, post it, you know, we'll we'll take a look at it but biblos is not the oldest city all right so you know definitely don't want to be spreading that all right so okay so with that i'm gonna say shimam hotep and i hope everyone enjoys the rest of their friday evening and uh and the weekend and like i said we'll do this more um more often uh we used to have uh freestyle fridays on friday night at 9 p.m but you know we kind of um working on other things maybe we'll probably start that up but we got a different series uh 
um, welcome to the Sabait Dome, Freestyle Fridays, Divine Words Wednesdays, and Ask Me Anything where we just, you know, have good discussions. So just be on the lookout. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Subscribe uh, to, um, I mean, join our Facebook group. Subscribe to this channel and make sure you click the notification uh, button. All right. So I'm going to say Shem Hotep. I'll see you all next time.